What's up guys? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn as Izuku with System Quirk. Part 2. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. With Nisa knowing about the attack in advance, or at least being aware that something might happen, the response of UA's resident heroes and the police was exceptionally swift. Literally dozens of squad cars and a handful of SAT teams arrived within minutes, accompanied by a veritable army of paramedics and other emergency services. Unfortunately, shortly after all might leaped into the fray, Aizawa and 13 forced Izuku and the rest of class 1A to evacuate before the former returned to provide support. As a result, Izuku wasn't present to witness All Might taking on the burgeoning League of Villains. Instead, he was forced to remain a safe distance away, protected by a group of local pros that included Kami Woods, Empty Lady, Death Arms, and 13. Man, this sucks, remarked Kirishima. We should be in there lending a hand, not sitting out here like school children. Ever the stickler, Ida responded. While my spirit burns just as intensely as yours, Kirishima Kuen, the fact remains that we are still in school. If we attempted to assist at our current level, we would only get in the way. Unable to refute Ida's words, Kirishima slumped his shoulders, reiterating, This really sucks. Though he didn't disagree with Kirishima, Izuku couldn't help frowning slightly. He had the advantage of being able to see a person's level and stats, but even if he didn't, he didn't think it was appropriate for kids to be on a battlefield. Such settings were common in anime, but in reality, it was pretty messed up. Noticing the glower on Izuka's face, Achiko leaned over slightly, hands behind her back as she looked up at him and asked, Is everything alright, Izuka Kuin? You seem really tense. Adopting a practiced but reassuring smile, Izuka replied, Thanks for your concern, Achiko-san, but I'm alright. This incident has shown me that I need to get stronger. That's all. Hmm. Though she could tell Izuku wasn't being completely truthful, Achiko didn't press him to reveal his true feelings. Instead, she caught him a little off guard by facing forward, a resolute light appearing in her eyes as she said, We'll do it together in a firm tone. Turning to look at Achiko's profile, Izuku was about to say something when the former, seemingly realizing her words could be taken out of context, quickly added, as a class, I meant we should work hard to get stronger as a class. Attracted to Achiko's outburst and embarrassed flailing, Mina appeared with a teasing smile, asking, what's going on over here? Are the two of you over here flirting while everyone else is distracted? Stamping her foot, Achiko loudly replied, It isn't like that. Ashido-san, izuka Kuin, and I are just friends. Instead of responding to Achiko, Mina started at Izuko, narrowing her eyes in amusement as she teased. You hear that, izuka Kuin? Looks like you've been friend-zoned. Resisting the urge to grab and pull Mina's flexible horns, Izuka shook his head, an unperturbed smile developing across his face as he said, that's fine by me. All I've ever really wanted was to be everyone's friend. Without waiting for Mina's response, Izuku shifted his gaze to Achiko, winking as he added, at least for now, though she already had a slight blush on her face. Accenting the two permanent blush marks adorning her cheeks, Achiko's face became bright red when she heard Izuka's playful remark. If they weren't in the midst of a crisis, she very well might have used her zero-gravity quirk to float away. Several hours after the USJ incident concluded, Izuku, once again, found himself summoned by Principal Nizu. This time, however, the venue was the teacher's lounge. Also, instead of the two of them, 
All Might and a rather plain-looking man that had introduced himself as Detective Tsukachi were present. While Izuku sat next to Nizu on one sofa, All Might and Tsukachi sat across from them, the latter taking the initiative to say, I apologize for asking you to be here when you've already given a statement. However, I've learned from Principal Nizu and All Might that you possess a quirk and information that could prove useful to our investigation. Immediately following Tsukachi's words, All Might appended, Fear not, young Midoriya. Detective Tsukachi is someone you can trust. He and I go way back, so you need not conceal anything before him. Nodding his head, Izuku replied, I understand, in a firm tone. He didn't have a strong impression of Tsukachi from the anime, but he vaguely remembered him being one of the few entrusted with All Might's secret. Supply a knot of his own, Tsukachi said. I appreciate your willingness to cooperate, before pulling out a palm-sized pocketbook. He had several queries of his own, but he first wanted to get through the questions Nizu had petitioned him to ask, first and foremost being, were you aware that a group of villains would attack the unforeseen simulation joint before it occurred? Without hesitation, Izuko answered, yes. I did not know precisely when they would attack, but I knew it would occur. Detecting no falsehoods in Azuka's words, a benefit of his lie detection quirk, Tsukachi gave a curt nod and asked, Do you possess a perk called intuition that allows you to sense when an incident may occur? Though he realized what was happening based on Tsukachi's line of questioning, Azuka didn't panic answering, Yes, it's a benefit granted to me when my luck attribute reaches 100. Furrowing his brows slightly, Tsukachi commented, It would be best if you answered my questions honestly. Feigning shock, aided by the fact he was surprised, Izuko asked, What do you mean? Was there something wrong with my response? Adopting a serious expression and tone, Tsukachi revealed, My quirk allows me to tell when someone is lying or being deceitful. When I asked if you possessed a perk called intuition, my quirk flagged your response as false or misleading. Ah, uh, pretending as though he had just realized the problem. Izuka's expression relaxed as he explained, I mentioned this to Principal Nizu and All Might previously, but my quirk allows me to redistribute my attributes. I was in possession of the intuition perk before this incident. I have since invested in attributes that would help ensure my survival. Sensing no falsehoods in Azuka's words, the somewhat grim expression on Tsukachi's face faded, replaced by an awkward smile as he said, I see, in a curt tone. Then, without missing a beat, he proceeded to ask, Are you a spy that has been sent to infiltrate the campus and report on its vulnerabilities? Adopting a genuinely offended look, Izuka responded, No. I enrolled in UA to protect people. I would never do anything to jeopardize the safety of my fellow students, at the very least not intentionally. Inserting himself into the exchange as if he wasn't the one who tasked Sakachi with uncovering Izuka's intentions, Nizu asserted, I believe it would be best if we moved on from this particular line of questioning. I do not wish to keep Midoriya Koen here any longer than is necessary. Understood. Returning the palm-sized pocketbook to the interior breast pocket of his trench coat, Tsukachi asked the question Izuka had been anticipating for quite some time. Specifically, were you able to ascertain the identities and quirks of the villains who attacked USJ? We hope to create a profile on them before conducting the official interrogation. Regaining his smile, Izuku pulled out a pocketbook of his own, handing it over as he explained, I didn't have time to inspect each of them, but it was fairly obvious who the ringleaders were, allowing me to memorize their statuses and subsequently record them. What struck me as particularly odd was that each and every one of them possessed multiple quirks. Hearing Izuka's explanation, the expressions and bodies of Tsukachi, All Might, and Niza tensed. It didn't help that one of the names recorded in was someone Niza recognized. He had memorized the names and faces of virtually every student that attended UA, especially those that had lost their lives before having a chance to graduate. Shirakumo Koen, similar to Nizu, 
All Might and Tsukachi also recognized one of the names recorded in the pocketbook. However, as there were multiple families with the name Shimura, they didn't immediately assume there was a connection between Tenko Shimura and the Shimuras they were thinking of. More accurately, they refused to believe it. Catching Izuku a little off guard, All Might, wearing an uncharacteristically grim expression, said, We thank you for your assistance, but I believe it's time you made your way home, young Midoriya. But don't worry, I promise to offer you an explanation in the future. Nodding in approval, Niza calmly appended, I believe that may be for the best. Thank you for your time, Midoriya Cohen, and please take care on your way home. Though he didn't expect to be released so suddenly, Izuka didn't hesitate to rise to his feet, offering a respectful bow to the grim trio as he said, I'll be leaving first, before rising to his full height and promptly departing, with the school contacting each of their parents to apprise them of the situation. Izuka's return home was met by his mother's tearful embrace. He did his best to assure her that everything was okay, but it wasn't until three hours later that he was able to escape her coddling. By then, he had 999 plus text notifications, the result of Mina inviting everyone in the class to a group chat. Instead of reading through the past messages, Izuku typed a simple, just got home. How is everyone doing? With a concerned emoji. The moment he did so, dozens of responses began to fill the chat, followed by several people messaging him directly. After reading just a few of the responses, a wry smile adorned Izuka's face as he typed, It's good to see that everyone is in high spirits. And thanks for your concern, but I'm fine. I'm probably about to hit the hay though. Feels like it's been a long day. Though most people took the hint, wishing him a good night, Izuka's DMs were still blowing up with messages from Achiko, Tsuyu, and Mina. They had been present when he was escorted away by Detective Tsugachi's subordinates, so they were understandably concerned. As it was fairly refreshing to be popular, Izuka didn't mind staying up to alleviate the girl's concerns. He approximated his chances with Mirko to be less than 10%, but that was predicated on her permitting him to apply for an internship. If she didn't watch the UA Sports Festival or didn't care about accepting an intern, his chances effectively decreased to zero. In that case, he would have very little choice but to turn to the girls in his class if he wanted to enter a relationship. Recalling Achiko's inadvertent remark about growing stronger together, a faint smile developed across Izuka's face. He wasn't ashamed to admit that in the past, Achiko was the girl he was least interested in getting to know. His personal ranking placed Hagakure at the top, followed by Jiro, Yairuzu, Mina, Tsuyu, and then Achiko. Not because she wasn't cute, but because she was the most vanilla among the girls. Now that he was gradually getting to know Achiko better, Izuka couldn't deny she was growing on him. She was an incredibly kind and caring girl, and the tiny pads on her fingers were as cute as they were soft. She also had an incredible figure, so Izuka didn't think he would lose out by dating her. Rather, with her zero-gravity quirk, they would probably have a blast experimenting with its uses. With such thoughts in mind, Izuka stayed on his phone until around 10 p.m. Then, after wishing the girls good night, he dragged his feet over to his computer, exhaling a weary sigh before grabbing the nearby box of tissues. Teenage hormones were a pain in the ass. Hopefully, it wouldn't be much longer until he had someone to deal with his urges for him. I'm bored. With school being closed to facilitate the police's investigation and an internal security review, Izuku found himself with the day off and no plans. If it were the past, he would have spent his free time modifying patents or conducting market research. However, while that was still an option, his diminished intelligence and dexterity made it comparable to playing his favorite game on inferior hardware. He could... It simply wasn't as enjoyable. Ding. Hmm. Since his phone was set to chime only if there was an emergency or a high-priority message, Izuku was both surprised and not to find he had received a text from Nizu. If it isn't an inconvenience, 
Please make your way to the school as soon as possible. There are matters of paramount importance we would like to discuss with you. There go my chances of asking one of the girls on a date, muttered Izuku. However, despite this utterance, he practically leaped out of bed to prepare. There were only a handful of reasons Nizu could be calling him in like this, most of which were extremely beneficial. Thus, after telling his mom the police needed to ask him a few follow-up questions, Izuku ran to the school instead of taking the train. Surprised by how quickly Izuku had reached the campus, Nizu, once again accompanied by All Might and Sakachi remarked, You're here much sooner than I expected. Midoriya Koen, were you in the area when you received my message? Adopting a wry smile and rubbing the back of his head, Izuku revealed, Sensei's text mentioned this was a matter of paramount importance. So I came running as quickly as I could. My maximum speed is faster than the trains at the station, so I may have violated the provision prohibiting the use of quirks without a license. Though Tsukachi frowned upon hearing Izuku's admission, Nizu and All Might were all smiles as the former exhaled a light chuckle and mused, I appreciate you treating this matter seriously. However, as the principal of UA, I'm obligated to ask you not to violate the statutes of the association in the future. Without waiting for Izuku's response, Nizu shifted his gaze to Tsukachi asking, Well then, shall we be off? Nodding his head, Tsukachi rose to his feet while Nizu hopped down from the sofa, the duo hastily departing so that All Might and Izuku could be alone. Their sudden and swift exit caused tensions within the room to become palpable. But Izuku did his best to appear calm despite sitting as straight as a rod. Leaning forward and linking his fingers together, All Might's expression and tone were solemn as he revealed, The duo you identified as Tenko Shimura and Oboro Shirakumo have disappeared from their confinement. According to the medical team responsible for their treatment, a strange black liquid burst forth from their mouths, swallowing them before the on-site security had a chance to respond. Though he wasn't surprised by All Might's words, Izuku couldn't prevent a discontent frown from marring his face. Tamura was a key player in many of the future events he wished to avoid. If All Might had killed rather than apprehended him, All For One would either need to reveal himself or bide his time rearing a new successor. Believing that Izuku was upset because the man who had targeted him and his friends had gotten away, All Might adopted a somewhat forced smile, assuring, Worry not, young Midoriya. We have competent people working around the clock to uncover their location. We'll locate and have them in custody before you know it. Forcing a smile of his own, Izuku replied, I pray that's the case. That quirk, decay, Seems like it could cause tremendous harm if allowed to be unleashed at its full potential. Recalling the danger he had felt when Tamura attempted to touch his face, All Might couldn't help nodding in response to Izuka's words. Then, with a resolute look, he said, Alas, that isn't the reason I called you here. Rather, in light of recent developments, there's something important we need. No, we must discuss. Waiting for Izuka to steal himself and reply, I'm ready. All Might went on to reveal the origin of his combined quirks one for all, the fate of its many wielders, and the responsibility thrust upon them. They had been engaged in a more than 100 year struggle to defeat a man who referred to himself as All for One, the symbol of evil. As his name implied, All for One had the power to steal the quirks of people he touched, utilizing them for his own purposes or transplanting them into others. Doing so had allowed him to become the shadow ruler of the world. As, with the exception of One for All's wielders, there were none who could oppose him. Even then, until All Might's generation, every single user of One for All had been slain by All for One. Listening to All Might recount his past, Izuka's body was incomparably tense. He was well acquainted with Everything All Might was revealing, but hearing it in person hit differently. The gravitas of All Might's words placed legitimate pressure on him, leaving him completely speechless in their wake. Meeting Izuka's gaze, All Might's body began exuding steam as he said, I'm telling you, 
these things for three reasons, Midoriya Cohen. Yesterday's events revealed that my nemesis, all for one, may still be alive. If not, a person with a very similar power has appeared. Thus, if you are to inherit my power in the future, becoming the ninth successor of one for all, you must be prepared for the possibility of facing off against the greatest evil this world has ever known. Can you do that? Can you stare into the abyss of evil without flinching? Overwhelmed by the intensity of All Might's words, Izuku found himself unable to respond. He honestly wasn't sure he had what it took to face off against a genuine monster like All for One. However, if he sat back and entrusted everything to others, there was a very good chance he would come to regret it. Thus, as the silence between him and All Might lingered, Izuka's expression gradually hardened, culminating in the response, If it must be done, I would rather it be me than someone else, having already lived and sacrificed himself once. Izuku felt he had less of a right to live in this world than others. He may have the memories of the original Izuku, but he was ultimately an outsider, taking advantage of his previous life's knowledge for personal gain. If he didn't give anything back at all, he would have done more harm to this world than good, and Izuku hated having read in his ledger. Though it took a little longer than he would have liked, Izuku's response brought a smile to All Might's face. After all, while the desire to be a hero was required to wield one for all, it was far more important to possess a strong will and a spirit of sacrifice. Most aspiring heroes sincerely wanted to help others, but very few would walk into a situation knowing there was a strong possibility they would die. Canceling his muscle form transformation, All Might abruptly changed from a 220 centimeters, 255 kilograms mountain of muscle to a lanky, borderline skeletal man with a gaunt face and sunken eyes. It was an exceptionally drastic transformation, but Izuku didn't flinch asking, is this the side effect of overdrawing your power? Shaking his head, All Might raised his dress shirt to reveal a vicious scar that radiated from his rib cage like a webbed impact crater. Just looking at it would cause others to wince, but All Might just exhaled a sigh, his voice surprisingly deep and gravelly as he explained, During my battle with All for One, I received an injury that damaged most of my internal organs and annihilated my stomach. Now, I can only wield my power for around three hours before compromising the total amount of time I have left. Letting his shirt fall, All Might, better known as Tashinori in his current form, met Izuka's gaze as he added, This is the true reason I became a teacher at UA. While teaching here, people won't expect me to appear as frequently as I used to. It allows me to save what little power I have left to teach the person that will become my successor. Swallowing hard. Izuku would be lying if he said he wasn't nervous while asking, Does that mean? Nodding his head, Tashinori replied, If you're willing, I would like you, Izuku Midoriya, to inherit my power and, if possible, become the next symbol of peace. I believe that your digitalization quirk may be the only power that can adapt my own before the next great battle. I don't know when it will occur, but if All for One is truly still alive, it's only a matter of time before he strikes. Understanding better than anyone just how right Tashinori was, Izuku no longer hesitated, nodding his head with a firm resolution in his eyes. He still believed his quirk was more than capable of securing his position in the world. But with monsters exceeding level 1000 appearing, he simply didn't have time to take things slow. Not when most of the major events he was knowledgeable of occurred during the original Izuka's first year in school. Seeing the determination in Izuka's eyes, Tashinori plucked one of the luminous golden hairs from his head, grinning like a skull-faced demon as he said, Now if you've prepared yourself, eat this. Though he knew it was coming, Izuka's still deadpanned in response to Tashinori's words. However, eating a hair was far less disconcerting than imbibing All Might's blood, sweat, tears, or saliva. Thus, after a moment of silence, Izuku forced a smile and asked, 
Can I put it on a bagel and wash it down with some coffee? A few hours after ingesting All Might's hair, Izuku was in a training room prepared by Nizo. His exposed upper body caked in sweat as he fended off the never-ended swarm of ghost-like opponents wearing trench coats and black bodysuits. Clones provided as a courtesy of his mathematics teacher, phantom hero, Ectoplasm. Though Ectoplasm was far from the most physically capable hero, even losing his legs in the line of duty, his ability to create upwards of 36 ghostly clones made him a difficult opponent. At the very least, that was the case for ordinary opponents and villains. With azure blue electricity crackling around his body, Izuku repelled six of Ectoplasm's clones with the wind pressure generated by his hand. Then, in the same series of motions, he executed a sweeping sidekick, creating a blade-like shockwave that bifurcated the clones and left an impression in the reinforced steel wall behind them. This is incredible, muttered Izuku, unable to keep a smile from his face even as his body screamed in protest. After all, not only was he adapting to the energy flowing through his body, but every time he defeated one of Ectoplasm's clones, his experience would increase upwards of 1,500 XP in a single go. It was indescribably exhilarating name. Izuka Midoriya. Quirk. Digitalization, transfer, stockpiling, singularity, gear shift, sealed. Far gene, sealed. Danger sense, sealed. Black whip, sealed. Smokescreen, sealed. Float, sealed. Current level, 16 to 19. 54,108 to 88,295 EXP. Effective level, 485. Attributes. Strength, 50 to 680. Author's note, with OFA activated. Agility, 50 to 680. Author's note, with OFA activated. Vitality, 1002720. Author's note, with OFA activated. Intelligence, 62. Dexterity, 50 to 680. Author's note, with OFA activated. Luck, 15 to 30 from leveling up. Free attributes, zero rerolls available. Two perks, bronze skin, fleet footed, lesser regeneration, healthy body, sharp mind, nimble fingers. Author's note, for those disappointed with this development, the novel is called BNHA. Singularity for a reason. But don't worry, while Izuka may have inherited one for all, it will ultimately be playing second fiddle to his digitalization quirk and the many perks it provides. After defeating all of Ectoplasm's clones, the lightning crackling around, Izuku gradually receded, followed by his plopping down and sprawling out his arms and legs. Oh, gods. This pain is worse than when I began exercising for the first time. Though the power granted by One for All was incredible, enough to make Izuku feel like an idiot for not getting his hands on it sooner, the sequelae were no joke. He could sustain boosting his attributes by 10x fairly easily, but 15x placed a massive strain on his body, similar to Goku overusing the Kaioken. Approaching the downed Izuku, Tashinori remarked, your quirk truly is amazing. Being able to control the output of One For All immediately after receiving it is more than I could have hoped for. Trying and failing to force himself to a seated position awry, pain-tinged smile adorned Azuka's face as he replied, Yeah, but if I use too much, my body feels like it's going to burst. I'll need to experiment with my attribute distribution until I figure out a good balance. Nodding his head, Tashinori extended Izuku a hand, helping the latter to his feet as he said, Now let's get you over to Recovery Girl. The principal is already pulling strings to ensure you can grind, experience sufficiently in the future. For now, just focus on comprehending your new power without overdoing it. Resisting the urge to point out they should have brought Recovery Girl to him rather than forcing him to go to her, Izuka's pained smile broadened as he said, no worries on that end. My intelligence is a bit low right now, but I became a fairly meticulous person during the two years leading up to my enrollment. I won't do anything crazy. I'll take your word for it, responded Tashinori with a smile. 
He still vividly recalled the scenes of Izuku charging into a group of robots and climbing the zero pointer. Izuku may not be conventionally reckless, but he definitely had his moments. After Recovery Girl fixed him up with a simple kiss, Izuku returned home to get some rest. At the very least, that was his intention before pulling out his phone and discovering quite a few missed texts. Though most of the messages were random conversational texts, Izuku's brows perked up when he thumbed through a text from Mina asking if he wanted to hang out. It was from earlier that morning, but there was plenty of light left in the day. In fact, it wasn't even noon yet. Before responding to Mina's invitation, Izuku read through his remaining messages to ensure he wasn't inadvertently ghosting anyone. Once that was done, he typed a quick message explaining why he hadn't responded sooner before commenting that he would be happy to hang out. Less than 10 seconds after Izuku sent his text, his phone buzzed. That was a good sign. But Izuku was momentarily confused when he read the contents of Mina's message stating, Great. We're at the Star Arcade near Tatooine Station. Hurry on over. We... Realizing he was being invited to hang out with a group, various thoughts pervaded Izuka's mind. As far as he was aware, none of the other boys were particularly close to the girls in class. In other words, there was a decently high probability that the wee Mina was referring to was Achiko, Tsuyu, or some of the other girls in class. Though he would be lying if he said he didn't have second thoughts, Izuka quickly replied, Sure, on my way without asking for clarification. Being the only guy among a group of girls was dangerous for a number of reasons, but Izuku wasn't too concerned. After all, the girls in his class were nothing like the Me Too era party girls he would encounter at the nightclubs in his previous life. Following the sound of Mina's voice, Izuku looked over at the arcade's concession area to find a smiling, predominantly pink girl flagging him down. More importantly, at least at a glance, she appeared to be alone. That was unless you noticed the blue and pink tank top floating next to her. This girl is turning into one hell of a wingman, thought Izuku, making his way over to the girl's table with a smile. Then, instead of focusing his attention on Mina, he took a moment to direct his smile to the presumed location of Hagakure's invisible face, saying, Hey there, Hagakure-san. I didn't expect to see you here. Before Hagakure could respond, Mina narrowed her eyes and covered her mouth, snickering like a mischievous imp before saying, See, what did I say, Hagakure-chan? This guy is nothing if not thorough when it comes to hitting on women. Though it was invisible due to her lack of hand and wrist accessories, Hagakure rubbed the back of her head and laughed nervously in response to Mina's words. As for Izuku, he gave a casual shrug and replied, I'm not going to deny it. When it comes to cute girls, I can't help presenting them a bit of lip service. Crossing her arms, Mina maintained her smile as she said, So you say, but you haven't even seen Hagakure-chan's face. How can you say she's cute? Shaking his head, Izuku's expression became serious as he asserted, I'm not just saying it. I know for a fact that Hagakure-san is one of, if not the cutest girls in class. My intuition about these kinds of things is never wrong. Cupping her cheeks with her hands, Hagakure averted her invisible eyes, unable to meet Izuku's intense gaze as she said, I'm not that cute, in an uncharacteristically timid tone. Raising his hands in a mock surrender, Izuku appended, I won't press the matter if it's making you uncomfortable but remaining silent won't change my opinion. If you weren't invisible, Hagakure-san, I'm certain you would captivate the entire school with your beauty. Clapping her hands together, Mina exclaimed, Okay, I think that's about enough out of you, Casanova. Save the flirting for if the two of you go on a date. For now, let's focus on playing games, singing karaoke, and having some fun. Seemingly just as eager to escape Izuka's praise, Hagakure pumped her invisible fists, exclaiming, Yeah, let's have a blast! In her usual bubbly tone, her face, ears, and neck were an almost luminous shade of red, but thanks to her invisibility, neither Izuku nor Mina could see them. 
After schooling Mina in various fighting games and singing his heart out at karaoke, Izuku was in a phenomenal mood as he made his way home. He hadn't managed to get on a first-name basis with Hagakure, but he knew it was only a matter of time. After all, while she might be invisible, Izuku could sense Hagakure sneaking peeks at him throughout the impromptu hangout. To confirm this, he would periodically turn toward her, smiling as he stared at the approximate location of her face, causing her to startle like a kid caught trying to steal a cookie. As she had been invisible since birth, Hagakure was accustomed to going unnoticed and being able to observe others without getting caught. Izuka suspected that, so long as he gave the invisible girl the attention she very clearly desired, Hagakure may very well be the easiest girl to approach in the entire class. Well, her and Yairozu. Izuku got the impression that if he were prepared to take responsibility, Yairozu would permit him to do whatever he wanted. With such thoughts in mind, Izuku pulled out his phone and sent a quick text to Yairozu, asking what time she wanted him to come in. That way, even if he were just a minute or two early, it would probably leave a deep impression on the intelligent but exceedingly sheltered Ojisama. Catching Izuku a little off guard, Yairozu's response came immediately stating, 7.30 a.m. should suffice. I look forward to seeing you then. Responding with a quick likewise, Izuku returned his phone to his pocket, raised his gaze to the sky, and smiled. The escape of Tamura and Kurajari still weighed heavily on the back of his mind, but he felt calmer and more confident than ever. Just by tensing an invisible muscle, he was able to channel a seemingly endless amount of energy through his body. It would take time to master, but knowing he could level small buildings, produce powerful shockwaves, or leap hundreds of meters whenever he wanted was, for lack of a better descriptive, euphoric. With Yairozu asking him to come in at 7.30, Izuka made certain he was on campus by 7. As anticipated, Yairozu arrived a few minutes before she asked Izuku to come in, resulting in a rather adorable expression of surprise when she noticed he was already present. Since her desk was two places behind Izuka's, Yairozu made her way toward him as she asked, Midori Kuin, how long ago did you arrive? Adopting a faint, slightly teasing smile, Izuka replied, When I read your text and saw that you were looking forward to seeing me, I couldn't help arriving a little earlier. Witnessing the adorably surprised look on your face made it more than worth it. Contrasting the other girls in class, Yairozu, seemingly oblivious to the fact she was being teased, adopted a smile of her own as she replied, I see. I'm glad my reaction could boost your spirits. You seemed pretty out of it the other day, so I'm pleased to see you back to your usual antics. Not expecting such a considerate response, Izuka couldn't help feeling a little ashamed. He recovered fairly quickly, but the notion he shouldn't be playing around with such earnest girls briefly crossed his mind. Exhaling through his nose, Izuku adopted a far more genuine smile as he said, Thanks, Yairoza-san, and sorry for worrying you. I had a lot on my mind that day. Shaking her head and crossing her arms in a way that inadvertently emphasized her melons, Yairozu proudly asserted, No need to apologize. After all, we promise to look after one another. I'm merely returning the favor you showed me previously. Feeling even more awkward, the smile on Izuka's face cramped as he yielded to the compulsion to rub the back of his head. He didn't expect his past words to be used against him so suddenly, but it wasn't a bad feeling. Rather, more and more, he was starting to realize that all the girls in class 1A were kind, considerate, and genuinely good people. With homeroom starting at 8.25, Aizawa made his way into the classroom with a notably more haggard appearance than usual. He was clearly going through something, but carried on as if it was just another day. His tone as flat as his expression as he said, I have only a single announcement. One month from now, in the second week of May, UA will be hosting its annual sports festival. This is a tremendous opportunity you only get three times before graduation. As such, for the next month, most of your foundational hero studies classes will be optional. If you would rather spend your time in the gym 
or honing your quirks in UA's state-of-the-art training facilities, you are welcome to do so. Directing his gaze to Izuku and Yairozo, conveniently located in the same corner of the room, Aizawa added. It is the responsibility of the representative and vice representative to submit a copy of everyone's training itineraries and ensure the necessary forms are submitted before utilizing the training facilities. Can the two of you handle that? Without missing a beat, Izuku adopted a smile and responded. Easily, Yayorozu was a little less sure, but hearing Izuku's response compelled her to offer a nod, adding, We'll do our best, in a resolute tone. Nodding his head in approval, Aizawa said, That'll be all then, before surprising nearly everyone by promptly departing the classroom. Luckily, UA High's sports festival was one of the most popular events in the entire country, further broadcast throughout the world. It had even replaced the Olympics in Japan. So even if Aizawa didn't provide a proper explanation, it was fairly easy to gather information on past events, perhaps because they didn't face off against the villains directly, the event where the members of Class 1B appeared to confront Class 1A never happened. A few people came by during lunch to ask about what happened, but they departed fairly quickly after learning Class 1A had evacuated before the fighting started. In the wake of their uneventful lunch, Yairozu asked everyone to fill out the schedules and request forms Aizawa had provided before heading off for their training. After that, true to the school's doctrine of freedom, they basically had an entire month of afternoon classes to utilize as they pleased. As he was still waiting for the assistant Nizu had prepared for him, Izuku did the opposite of nearly every other student in class 1A by partaking in the optional foundational heroics course. Midnight was scheduled to give a presentation on positive public relations, so Izuka figured he could earn some brownie points with the hottest teacher in the school by attending. Unfortunately, not that Izuku was too surprised, Midnight's lecture was an open class, so nearly a hundred, predominantly male students showed up. As a result, he was just another face in the crowd, while the buxom beauty went on about the importance of networking, team-ups, and public image. This was especially true for aspiring male heroes, as they made up nearly 85% of active heroes. In other words, they had a lot of competition if they wanted to stand out. Following the hour and a half lecture, Midnight invited everyone for an impromptu meet and greet, allowing attendees to either shake her hand or have something signed by her. Izuka had no interest in being a part of the rabble, however, so he was among the first to depart the auditorium. With nothing better to do, Izuku made his way back to class 1A to see if anyone was loitering around. Odds were that they were preparing for the sports festival, but it didn't hurt to take a look. What he never, not in a million years, expected was to walk in on Mineta in the midst of sniffing Yairoza's seat in the dark. Not expecting anyone to walk in when the lights were dimmed, Mineta stared back at Izuku like a deer caught in the headlights. He had done his best to restrain himself after his expulsion, but the sudden appearance of villains at USJ had reminded him that life was full of surprises. You never knew when the Grim Reaper would come to collect his dues, so he decided to remain true to himself, even if others couldn't understand him. Catching Mineta by surprise, Izuku shook his head, exhaling a tired sigh as he said, Whatever, man. Just wipe it down when you're finished, and don't let me catch you harassing our classmates directly. Without waiting for Mineta's response, Izuku closed the door and walked away with his hands in his pockets. He would be lying if he said he wasn't appalled by Mineta's behavior, but he had once witnessed a fellow soldier using the corpse of an insurgent as a tire stop. People did some crazy crap when they reached their limits and felt extreme pressure, so he wouldn't say anything unless Mineta attempted some of the antics he pulled in the anime. Stopping Izuku before he could get too far, Mineta emerged from the classroom with an indignant expression and watery eyes as he exclaimed, You don't have the right to judge me. You don't know what it's like being half the height of everyone else and treated as a pervert. Furrowing his brows, Izuku looked over his shoulder and replied, I don't know what you experienced in your past, but the reason people treat you as a pervert is 
because you are one. Also, I'm not judging you. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt and hoping you'll correct yourself before you do something stupid. You wouldn't be here if the principal and staff didn't believe you had what it takes to become a hero. Remember that the next time you feel compelled to do something so shameless, finished with what he had to say, Izuku turned around, raising his hand in farewell as he walked off. Mineta had a number of reading moments in the anime, so he wouldn't go out of his way to get the diminutive grape head expelled. At least until he crossed a line he shouldn't. Staring at Izuka's back, Mineta wanted to tear the sticky, grape-like balls from his head and teach the former a lesson. Instead, his anger gradually gave way to an oppressive feeling of shame. It wasn't enough to prevent him from returning to the classroom, but he at least had second thoughts and made sure to give Yairose's seat a thorough cleaning. With Nisa's arrangements taking longer than anticipated, Izuku elected to spend Saturday afternoon at the school's state-of-the-art gym. There, alongside an assortment of standard training equipment, they had free weights up to 10,000 kilograms, a specialized hydraulic press that could measure lifting forces 10 times that amount, and a treadmill that simulated pulling up to six train cars. Though his initial plan was to train alongside Shoji, Ojiro, and Sato, Izuka changed his mind when he noticed a familiar figure hanging from one of the horizontal bars. It was more accurate to say he noticed their clothes, but that was semantics. Disregarding the unwritten rules about not approaching women keeping to themselves at the gym, Izuka made his way over to the dangling figure asking, Hey, Hagakure-san, trying to get some gains in before the sports festival? Hearing Izuka's voice, Hagakure exhaled a started. Eep! as she abruptly let go of the bar. She had specifically gone to a part of the gym where no one else was, so she didn't expect someone to sneak up behind her while she was focused on her dead hang. Resisting the urge to try and catch Hagakure as she fell, Izuka waited for her to plop on the thick blue mat beneath her before offering his hand, an apologetic smile on his face as he said, Sorry if I startled you. I noticed you were training by yourself so I thought I'd come over to see how you were doing. Breathing a sigh of relief, Hagakure accepted Izuka's help, rising to her feet before asserting, You could have called out to me in an audibly pouty tone. She was usually the one to startle people, so she was a little annoyed Izuku had gotten the drop on her. In response to Izuka's previous question, Hagakure took a moment to fix her gym clothes as she begrudgingly explained, I placed 19th in the last quirk apprehension test, just above my netakuin. I don't want to remain at the bottom of the class, so I decided to work on my strength and stamina in preparation for the sports festival. Ah, uh, I see, replied Izuku. Then, with a genuinely curious look, he asked, Have you ever trained like this before? Rubbing the back of her invisible head and smiling awkwardly, Hagakure replied, Not really. I was a part of the cheer squad in middle school, but this is my first time hitting the gym seriously. Why? Was I doing something wrong? Shaking his head, Izuko answered, Nah, I was just curious, and once again, sorry for before, I didn't mean to startle you. Finished with what he had to say, Izuko motioned as if he was about to leave. Before he could, Hagakure called out to him, asking, Hey, where are you going? Didn't you come over here because you wanted to train together or offer me advice? Looking back at the invisible girl, Izuku regained his smile as he replied, As I said, I was just curious. Seeing a girl's gym uniform hovering in the air was pretty conspicuous. So I came over to confirm it was you. Now that I know, I'll leave you to your business. Just let me know if you need anything. Raising his hand, Izuku turned as if to leave, but was once again stopped by Hagakure, this time grabbing his sleeve as she muttered, You have a slim and athletic body, so you must know a few training methods. Teach me some of them. Turning to face the presumably blushing girl, Izuku's smile broadened as he teased, If you're the one who's asking, I don't mind disclosing all of my secrets. Just tell me what you want to improve upon, and I'll suggest a suitable exercise. Fair warning, though, I take my training pretty seriously. 
If you want my help, I expect you to make an effort, stamping her foot and bawling her invisible hands into fists. Hagakure half exclaimed, I'm in the hero department too, you know. I won't give up or slack off, just because things are a little tough. Nodding his head, Izuka replied, Then I'd be glad to teach you. Though, considering we're rivals in the upcoming sports festival, I won't be here to watch over you every day. I have my own special training prepared, so this is just a temporary arrangement until then. Prompted by the words special training, Hagakure brought her right index finger to her chin, head tilted slightly to the side as she parroted. Special training? Is it related to your quirk? Nodding a second time, Izuku explained, It's supposed to be a secret, but I recently experienced a breakthrough that allows me to drastically enhance my physical capabilities for a short period. If I'm to have any hope of defeating Todoroki, I'll need to stabilize my power before then. Blinking her invisible eyes in surprise, a faint smile developed across Hagakure's face as she linked her hands behind her back and leaned forward slightly asking, It's a secret, huh? Does that mean you haven't told Ashido and the other girls? Pretending he didn't know what Hagakure was getting at, Izuka shook his head, confirming, Other than the principal and a handful of our teachers, you're the only one who knows about it. Why? Shaking her head, Though it was difficult to tell since Izuku could only see her clothes, Hagakure answered. Oh, no reason. I was just curious. And don't worry, I won't reveal your secret to anyone. In exchange, you can't tell anyone you're helping me train. Okay. Raising his brows, Izuku pointed out. I don't mind. But we're far from the only people using the gym. Anyone who looks over here, especially from our class, will realize I'm lending you a hand. With Hagakure remaining silent for several seconds, Izuka's expression became marginally concerned as he asked, Hagakure-san? Coming to her sense, Hagakure shook her head a second time, stating, Forget it. Let's just focus on our training, and if anyone asks what we're up to, we'll feign ignorance. Sound good. Though he was certain there was something else Hagakure had wanted to say, Izuka didn't hesitate to respond, Sounds good. Then, for the rest of the afternoon, he acquainted Hagakure with the very basics of strength and endurance training. What he didn't know, or at least pretended not to, was that, for a very brief moment, Hagakure had considered removing her clothes so that no one could see them training together. After what felt like an excessively long period of time, Izuka's first week at UA finally came to a close. However, while everyone else in Class 1A was enjoying their single day off, he was half-awake, dragging his feet to campus in order to make use of the support facilities. Since his original ensemble had been met with mixed reception, the first project Izuku was planning to work on was a new hero costume. He had yet to settle on a design, but he was considering something like Captain America's outfit from Avengers. Endgame. Or if he wanted something to complement his hair and eyes, a variation of a Green Lantern's outfit. With such thoughts in his mind, Izuku entered the support department's development studio, expecting to find it empty or occupied by one of the on-duty teachers. Instead, he encountered a girl with prominent, salmon pink dreadlocks and unusual golden eyes reminiscent of crosshairs. More importantly, she was staring back at him in a black tube top and a black boiler suit, whose upper half was half tied around her waist. Speaking before Izuku could regain his senses, the pink-haired girl said, You're not supposed to be in here, in a flat, matter-of-fact tone of voice. However, when she noticed the briefcase-like tool case he was carrying, one of the most expensive on the market, her reticle-like eyes appeared to focus, an excited grin blossomed across her face. Charging toward Izuku as if she were a piece of metal attracted by a powerful magnet, the salmon-haired girl, Mayhatsum, exclaimed, is that the S.H.I.E.L.D. MK47 Ultimate Series tool set? How on earth did you get your hands on such a precious set of tools? As the SMK47 USTS cost well over 30 million yen, it wasn't something the typical hobbyist could afford. However, as Izuka's primary revenue stream came from modifying and filing new patents, getting his hands on a top-of-the-line set of tools was very important, though he didn't mind in the slightest. 
Izuku adopted a wry smile as he replied, You should probably change your top before we talk. At this rate, I'll be too distracted to answer your questions properly. Hmm. Staring down at her fairly ample bosom, Hatsum asked, What's the problem? The bikini I wear during summer shows off a lot more skin. Besides, it's hella hot in here. You want me to overheat and pass out. Shrugging his shoulders, Izuka replied, If that's how it is, I won't press the matter further. As for your previous statement and the question that followed, firstly, I received permission from the principal to make use of the support department's facilities. Secondly, yes, this is the Shield MK. 47 Ultimate Series tool set. You have a good eye. Raising her hands as if she were about to give double peace signs, Hatsum pointed to her eyes, controlling her reticle-like pupils to expand and contract as she explained, It's thanks to my quirk, Zoom. It gives me a headache if I overuse them, but if I really focus, I can see objects up to five kilometers away. Pretty cool, huh? I'll say, replied Izuku. It's like having a high-powered microscope in your eyes sockets. I bet it's super useful for working with circuitry and microchips. As quite a number of people regarded her quirk as useless, Hatsum couldn't help smiling in response to Izuka's words, exclaiming, I know right. Before Izuku could respond, Hatsum beat him to the punch, adding, Anyways, Power Loader Sensei isn't here right now. Even if you really do have permission, I can't let you start working until he approves you. If it turns out you were lying, and I allowed you to do as you pleased, I'd risk having my special privileges taken away. Once again, speaking before Izuku could respond, Hatsum beamed as she exclaimed, Oh, I know. How about I show you around and introduce you to some of my babies? You must be pretty skilled if you own a set of tools like that. Maybe you can give me some tips. Without waiting for Izuku's response, Hatsum grabbed his hand and hauled him toward what many would presume to be a pile of scrap metal. Instead, it was a small mountain of support items, haphazardly packed together as if a Katamari Damacy had come through. Though Hatsum was a little overbearing, Izuku couldn't help smiling as she demonstrated dozens of her babies, original support items she had somehow managed to complete in the weeks since school began. As he had told Mina, Izuku's preferred type was a woman who was passionate about something she loved. Hatsum embodied this to an almost ludicrous extent, so much so he didn't even mind when one of her babies blew up in his face. Luckily, just before her little exhibition began, she lent him a pair of goggles with a powerful magnification property, an invention inspired by her quirk. Instead of asking if Izuku was okay, Hatsum exhaled a carefree laugh and commented, Sorry about that. But... You know what they say, failure is the mother of invention. Each mishap brings you one step closer to true greatness. Continuing from where she left off, Hatsum picked up a glove with rings around the joints and thin wires running along the interior of the fingers explaining, take this baby for example. She can increase a person's grip strength by up to 150 kilograms. The downside is that the wires have a tendency to break due to friction. If I could figure out a way to decrease the tension between the wires and the joints, I could increase the output five, maybe even ten times. Having wiped away the soot from his face, Izuka took a look at the gloves Hatsum had presented him, asking, Have you considered replacing the metal wires with artificial silk or microhydraulic cables? The latter may be bulkier, but you could get around the friction issue. Opening her eyes wide and smiling even broader than usual, Hatsum exuded a somewhat scary aura before abruptly grasping Izuka's hands and shouting, You and I are going to make so many babies together! Though he knew Hatsum was referring to support items, Izuka's mind momentarily blinked. He hadn't even considered Hatsum as one of his potential targets, but she had suddenly secured herself the top position among the girls he interacted with at school. Realizing how her words could be misconstrued, Hatsum released her hold on Izuka's hands. Crossing her arms as she casually remarked, You have quite the active imagination, don't cha? That's a necessary trait for an inventor. But you shouldn't let it distract you. Besides, 
Whoever I end up with needs to be able to support me, both creatively and financially. I don't have time for a romance that doesn't advance my goal of being the world's greatest inventor. Recovering from his brief stupor, a wry smile developed across Azuka's face as he shamelessly revealed, I currently make around 165 million yen a year, and it's only dash before Izuku could finish touting his worth. Hatsum once again grabbed his hands, her eyes practically sparkling as she said, Please date me with marriage in mind. I'll let you touch my boobs. Underlining her point, Hatsum squished her melons against Izuku, her reticle-like eyes staring into his, as if she were attempting to peer into his thoughts. It was surprisingly intimidating, but Izuku managed to remain fairly calm as he replied, as tantalizing an offer as that is, I think it best we start as friends. If it's financing you're after, I could potentially become your sponsor. I dash, interrupting Izuku before he could finish, Hatsum replied, Deal! Before giving him a firm, lingering hug as she teased, Looks like I might have to start calling you Papa. Let's make lots of babies together. Uh, what was your name again? Adopting a somewhat forced smile, Izuku replied, Izuku, Izuku Midoriya. Also, you dash, preempting Izuku's point. Hatsum abruptly released him, hands on her hips as she shouted, Good to meet you, Izuku! I'm Mei Hatsum, but you can just call me Mei. We'll be working together nice, close, and personally from now on, so there's no need for formalities. Abruptly transitioning to a more serious persona, Mei gazed at Izuku's body muttering. Speaking of which, approaching Izuku for the umpteenth time, Mei began feeling up his body as if it were a perfectly natural thing to do. Whoa, you look kind of ordinary in your uniform, but it turns out you're pretty jacked. Ha. Huh. Moving around to Izuka's back, Mei pressed her melons against him, her hands reaching around to caress the front of his body, adding, Nice. Is this a six, no, an eight pack? Mind taking off your clothes so I can get a better look? Inhaling a deep breath, Izuka grabbed Mei's hands, preventing them from roaming his body as he warned. You're playing with fire, Mason. If you mistake me for an ordinary, or Bivers high schooler, you're going to get burned. Shrugging her shoulders, May responded with a dismissive, Eh, I'm used to getting burned. While wriggling her fingers in Nezuka's grasp, she knew her actions were a little inappropriate, but she could tell Izuka didn't mind them. As for his threat, she didn't take it seriously. After all, what was the worst he could do while they were on campus grounds? Just as Izuku was seriously considering teaching Mei a lesson, the door to the development studio opened, followed by the entrance of a short, shirtless man wearing an oversized helmet resembling an excavator claw. Noticing the position Izuku and Mei were in a tense, awkward silence permeated the studio before the diminutive man exhaled a tired sigh and asked, what did I tell you about accosting other students, Hatsum-san? If you get expelled for sexual harassment, you'll never be able to become a successful inventor. Retracting her hands from Izuka's grasp, Mei exhaled an awkward laugh before defending her actions by pointing out, Don't worry, Sensei. Izuku is a fellow inventor. He's also my patron, so we'll probably start dating once he overcomes his shyness. At the very least, I'm confident he won't report me to the school's disciplinary committee. Exhaling an exasperated sigh, the diminutive man, Higuri Maijima, also known by his hero name, Excavation Hero, Power Loader, shifted his gaze to Izuku and said, Please don't take this fool of a girl's actions to heart. I promise you she doesn't mean any harm. She's just... Sparing Power Loader the effort of having to excuse Mei's actions, Izuku shook his head and affirmed, It's fine, Sensei. I'm well aware that Mei is simply passionate about her work. I can respect that. Undercutting Izuku's words, Mei beamed like a lighthouse in a storm as she said, Izuku and I are going to make tons of babies together, Sensei. You won't believe this, but he totally figured out a solution to baby number 26 after looking at it for, I don't know, maybe six seconds? Please, please, please let him work here. Ignoring Mei's words, Power Loader directed his gaze at Izuku, stating, I heard about you from the principal. He lauded you as a genius in the field of support, 
but I'll need to evaluate your skills personally before I let you use these facilities. I can't always be around to supervise you, so I need to know you're capable of handling yourself. Resisting the urge to point out he allowed May, infamous for creating devices that exploded, to work without supervision, Izuka nodded and replied, I'm ready, in a firm tone. He had redistributed his stats earlier that morning, so his intelligence and dexterity were currently sitting at 100. He might not be able to compare to a monster like May, but he was confident he could both meet and surpass Power Loader's expectations. After all, while his experience might be lacking, his attributes were even higher than the excavator-headed hero's name, Izuka Midoriya. Quirk, digitalization, transfer, stockpiling, singularity, gear shift, sealed. Fargene sealed. Danger sense sealed. Black whip sealed. Smokescreen sealed. Float sealed, current level. 19. 91,069 EXP. Effective level, 34. Attributes, strength, 10. Agility, 10. Vitality, 100. Intelligence, 100. Dexterity, 100. Luck, 22. Free attributes, 0. Rerolls available, 2. Perks, lesser regeneration, healthy body, sharp mind, eidetic memory, nimble fingers, keen senses. Name, May Hatsum. Quirk, zoom, current level, 12. Effective level, 37. Attributes. Strength. 11. Agility. 8. Vitality. 21. Intelligence. 149. Dexterity. 83. Luck. 103. Name. Higuri Maijima. Quirk. Iron Claws. Current level. 25. Effective level. 51. Attributes. Strength. 91. Agility. 28. Vitality. 208. Intelligence. 73. Dexterity. 59. Luck. 54. After passing Power Loader's tests with relative ease, Izuku earned the right to make use of the development studio. Better yet, instead of being restricted to Sundays, he was allowed to come in whenever he had a free afternoon. That was how much Power Loader valued his aptitude, enough that he was effectively willing to overlook the fact May behaved as if there were no personal boundaries between them. Fortunately, while Izuku wasn't able to escape becoming May's guinea pig, he didn't especially mind the salmon-haired girl's antics. Rather, now that he had become one-for-all successor, he knew he wouldn't have nearly as much time to dedicate to support work as he intended. Thus, while he planned to continue inventing, he was already considering just supporting May. She possessed the spark he lacked as an inventor. So if he focused on funding and promoting her creations, Izuku was certain he could make both of them very, very rich. After gaining access to the support facilities, Izuku split his afternoons between his duties as vice representative, helping Hagakure train and working in the development studio. May had readily agreed to help him conceive and produce a new hero costume. So the two of them worked together to ensure it was as stylish as it was functional. Unsurprisingly, Hagakure couldn't help wanting to know where Izuka disappeared to when they didn't train together. As a result, it wasn't long before her curiosity got the better of her, driving her to follow him in secret. She didn't enter the development studio directly, but she caught him exiting with Hatsum, compelling her to ask, Who was that girl with the pink dreadlocks? A few days later, though he was briefly confused by Hagakure's words, Izuka collected himself fairly quickly, asking, Are you referring to Meisan, the girl from the support department? Pointing to her own set of invisible eyes, Hagakure added, The girl with the scopes for eyes. Nodding his head, Izuku affirmed, That's Mei. Mei Hatsum. She's been helping me design a new hero costume, but I'm confused. When did the two of you have the chance to meet. Uh, realizing she hadn't thought of an excuse to explain how she knew May, Hagakure fumbled for a bit before flailing her arms and exclaiming, that isn't important right now. Aren't the support facilities supposed to be off limits to students from other departments? 
Yeah, but I received permission from the principal to make use of them, replied Izuko. I'm sure I've mentioned this in the past, but I have a knack for creating and modifying things. Before I enrolled in the hero program, I was seriously considering enrolling as a business or support student. Uh, recalling Achiko mentioning something in the group chat about Izuku having made a fortune by modifying patents. A potent blush developed through Hagakure's face. She had mistakenly believed that Izuku was using his free time to flirt with girls from other departments. Now that she knew the truth, she felt like an idiot. Feigning obliviousness to what Hagakure was thinking, Izuku remarked, Speaking of which, I heard about a third year who was able to have a hero costume made from his hair. His quirk is powerful, allowing him to phase through objects, but the caveat is that it also causes him to phase through his clothes by donating some of his hair follicles. The support department was able to cultivate enough to manufacture him a costume that became permeable along with his body want to try doing the same, though she was a little surprised and happy to learn Izuku was thinking about her. Even when they weren't together, Hagakure smiled wryly and explained, I'm actually a third generation invisibility user. My parents and grandparents tried something similar in the past, but the result was that the clothes would become visible as the cells and the hair died. Trust me, if there were a way to avoid having to run around naked in my hero costume, I would know about it. Rubbing the back of his head, Izuku smiled wryly as he remarked, That's a shame. Though, at the risk of sounding a little perverted, it's also kind of hot. The other day, when you suddenly fell silent, I thought for a moment you were going to suggest training in our hero outfits. I'd be lying if I said the notion didn't make me a little lightheaded. If she was blushing before, Hagakure was completely crimson when she heard Izuku's rather brazen remark. She often lamented being invisible, but in this particular instance, she was extremely grateful no one could see her face. Cupping her fiery cheeks, Hagakure averted her face and body, her eyes swimming in their sockets as she muttered, Midoriya Kuin, you perv, in a tickled pink tone. She had little experience dealing with boys since the majority simply ignored her. After all, while invisibility had a certain allure to it, most people based attraction purely on what their eyes could see. Thinking he may have pushed a little too hard, Izuka's expression became genuinely apologetic as he said, Sorry, that was probably out of line. I'll be more careful from now on. Catching Izuku a little off guard, Hagakure shook her head with enough vigor that her entire body moved with the motion. Then, in an incredibly hushed, nearly inaudible voice, she stammered, I, it's fine. The truth is, I actually did consider it just a little bit. Narahodo, while muttering, I see. In his mind, Izuku couldn't prevent a smile from developing across his face as he said, That's a relief. I was afraid I had offended you. These afternoon training sessions have been enjoyable, so I would have regretted it immensely if they came to an end. Seeing the relief in Izuku's expression and hearing the sincerity in his tone, the butterflies in Hagakure's chest and stomach threatened to rise up from her throat in the form of a girlish squeal. Instead, she massaged some of the tension from her cheeks, a vain attempt to calm herself as she mustered the courage to suggest, we could try it, you know, training in our hero costumes. As if she couldn't believe her own words, Hagakure covered her invisible face with her equally invisible hands, forcibly containing a squeal. As for Izuku, he was momentarily stunned by the proposition, his mind drawing a complete blank as his lips replied, I would like that, seemingly of their own accord. Sneaking a peek at Izuku through her fingers, as she was the sole person unable to see through her body, Hagakure noticed the dazed, somewhat adorkable look on his face. Izuku was several centimeters taller than the original, but his rounded face, large eyes, and four-spotted freckle pattern made him more cute than conventionally handsome. He was working hard to change that, but there was only so much he could do. The rest was up to genetics, testosterone, and his pituitary gland. Realizing that Izuku was more baffled than eager, Hagakure covered her mouth to stifle a giggle. Doing so caused Izuku to regain his senses, 
an embarrassed smile developing across his face as he said, Sorry, I think I may have spaced out for a bit. I must not be getting enough sleep. Seemingly having found her courage, Hagakure's tone contained a hint of laughter as she mused, Oh, are you thinking your mind is playing tricks on you? I was serious when I suggested we trained in our hero costumes, you know? Amazed by how quickly Hagakure's aura had changed, Izuka's feigned embarrassment gained a hint of authenticity as he ran his hand through his hair and replied, I'm not sure that's a good idea. I certainly want to, but it might cause some misunderstandings that could get us in trouble with the teachers and staff, not to mention our classmates. Believing that Izuka might be a so-called sheep in wolf's clothing, Hagakure felt a little emboldened, leaning forward in a way that nearly permitted him to see down her collar as she asserted, It's fine. It's not like we'll be breaking any rules. We'll just be training, just like we have for the past week. Resisting the urge to get a better vantage, Izuka replied, If it's okay with you, I'm certainly not going to complain. I mean, this is a tremendous win from my point of view. Regaining a bit of her timidity, Hagakure fixed her posture, hands linked behind her back as she avoided Izuka's gaze and responded, Then we'll start tomorrow. I need to prepare my heart a bit. Without waiting for Izuka's response, Hagakure turned around and ran away. They hadn't even started training yet, so this placed Izuku in a somewhat awkward position. Fortunately, it wasn't like he was without options, so after a moment of consideration, he decided to make his way to the development studio. There were a lot of support students present since it was a school day, but each had a designated workstation to avoid mishaps, sabotage, or theft of work. Izuka happened to share Mei's, much to the chagrin of her many cynics and admirers. So the two spend the afternoon making babies, stopping only when Power Loader kicked them out and told them to go home. True to her word, Hagakure showed up to training the next day in her hero costume. More accurately, she showed up in the version that ditched her gloves and boots for maximum stealth proficiency, nearly catching Izuku by surprise if not for his keen senses perk. Interrupting Hagakure's attempts to sneak up behind him and pointlessly cover his eyes with her hands, Izuka turned around, staring at the empty space where he presumed her face was located as he asked, Hagakure-san, is that you? Thinking for a moment that Izuku could see her, Hagakure covered her body with her hands, blushing across her entire body as she asked, H, how did you know it was me? Tilting his head slightly, Izuka pointed to the padded flooring below and said, I could hear you approach and your feet leave indentations in the matting. Now that we're this close, I can also smell your conditioner. Did you take a shower before coming to meet up? Slowly lowering her hands, not that Izuku could see them. Hagakure's expression became slightly accusatory as she remarked, You have really good senses. Thanks, replied Izuku. As aspiring heroes, it's important for us to be aware of our surroundings. Yours is the most comprehensive I've heard of. But you're not the only one with an invisibility quirk. Besides, I was really looking forward to this, so it's impossible for me not to notice you approaching. Feeling a little better, Hagakure regained a hint of her usually bubbly personality as she moved a little closer to Izuku and asked, Were you really looking forward to this? Is being in the presence of a naked girl all it takes to excite you? Waving his hand dismissively, Izuku asserted, you aren't just any girl, Hagakure-san. You're my classmate, and I'm still 100% convinced you're one of, if not the cutest girl in our class. Moving even closer to Izuku, Hagakure's tone was inordinately faint as she asked, But how can you be sure without confirming it? Go ahead. So long as it's just my face, I don't mind if you touch me. Blinking in surprise, Izuku asked, Seriously? In a similarly hushed tone. Hagakure nodded in response, but realizing Izuka couldn't see her, she softly replied, It's fine. I want you to know what I really look like, even if it's just a vague impression through touch. Swallowing the knot that had formed in his throat, Izuku extended his hand, not realizing how close Hagakure was standing to him. As a result, the tips of his fingers pushed against something very soft, 
causing a faint but startled ah to emanate from Hagakure's throat, retracting his hand as if he had just touched a hot burner. Izuka's eyes widened as he internally exclaimed, Well, that was damn stupid, in his mind. Fortunately, Hagakure wasn't discouraged by the very unexpected mishap. Instead, she surprised him by grasping his hand with her own and saying, Here, I'll guide you, in a nearly inaudible tone. Overwhelmed by the surrealness of the situation, Izuku became stock still as Hagakure guided his hand along the contours of her face. As she did, a vague impression of her features appeared in Izuka's mind, aided by his intelligence. However, this vague impression was more than enough to confirm what Izuku had heard in his previous life. Hagakure truly was an extraordinarily stunning young woman. She was also very warm, almost hot to the touch. Finished with her face, Hagakure hesitated for a moment before guiding Izuka's hand down her throat, stopping just above her collarbone as she nervously inquired, Well, what do you think? Voicing his honest thought aloud, Izuku unhesitantly affirmed, You're beautiful in a sincere tone. Hearing Izuka's firm, heartfelt response, Hagakure felt her chest tighten, her heart skipping a beat. At the same time, her legs instinctually closed, clamping her thighs together as an unbridled sense of giddiness swelled within her. Feeling Hagakure's rapidly increasing heartbeat through his palm, Izuku swallowed audibly. He planned to wait until after the internships before approaching the girls in his class seriously, but if Hagakure gave him the go-ahead, he doubted he would be able to restrain himself. Fortunately, or perhaps not, Hagakure abruptly released her hold on Izuka's hand, her voice sounding audibly nervous as she turned away from him and said, Aye, let's end things here for today. Sorry if it seems like I'm not taking our training seriously. I just, I need time to think. Nodding his head, Izuka's expression and tone softened as he said, I understand. Just remember to text me if you want to talk. If not, I'll see you tomorrow. Looking up at Izuku, a necessary action considering the 18 centimeters gap in their heights. Hagakure's eyes glistened invisibly as she said, Do you mind, I mean, can you close your eyes for a moment? Instead of responding with his words, Izuku closed his eyes, expectation building within his heart. Moments later, he felt a warmth near his body, a pair of hands grasping his arm and pulling him down slightly, as something soft pressed against his cheek. Lingering briefly before Hagakure released him and took off running, pressing his fingers to his cheek, Izuka's expression was a mix between awe and perplexity as he thought to himself. I may need to stop fooling around, though he considered himself a bit of a bastard. Engaging in more one-night stands than he could count, Izuku, at least when he lived as David, took committed relationships very seriously. He would never forgive a girl who cheated on him, so he afforded his partners the same courtesy. The one time he didn't, getting revenge against one of his cheating exes by sleeping with her best friend, he regretted it immensely. After all, while revenge was sweet, especially in the heat of the moment, the aftertaste was extremely bitter. Shaking such thoughts from his mind, Izuka took a moment to look around the gym before deciding he should head home. He also felt the need to sort his thoughts, so he sent a quick text to Mei, explaining that he had something to take care of before walking the entire way home on foot. After reaching home and ensuring his mother everything was okay, Izuku retired to his room, donning a pair of headphones to listen to music as he absentmindedly perused his portfolio and filled out the request forms for the materials Mei asked him to purchase. Japan was one of the more anal countries when it came to monitoring the flow of materials, support items, and other goods that could potentially be used with malicious intent, so it was important to be as above board as possible to avoid being visited or audited by the JNP, Japanese National Police, or the PSI, Public Security Intelligence Agency. Fortunately, Izuka's results during middle school and his reputation in the international support community made things significantly easier for him than most people. His backup school, had he failed to enter UA, was the world-famous I Island Academy. They had guaranteed him a study grant and a full-ride scholarship 
if he became a student. But Izuka refused after learning he had been accepted to OU. Still, with several executives on the board of directors paying attention to him, Izuku had an inordinately high trust rating with the companies who sold and distributed various difficult to acquire materials. Ding. Though he had eagerly awaited Niza's message the entire week, Izuku didn't immediately rouse to check his phone. He already had a good idea of its contents, so he just stared at it from across the room as he thought, What crappy timing! Finished with his griping, or at least shelving it for later, Izuku got from his bed to check his phone. Unsurprisingly, the message he had received was from Principal Nizu, happily informing him that the arrangements for his special training were finally completed. Though, as it was fairly late in the day, he would need to wait until tomorrow to begin. Haya. While he was relieved that he could finally start grinding, Izuku wasn't too happy with Niza's timing. At the very least, that was the case until he saw that one of his recent messages was from Hagakure. He had been so out of it earlier he had completely forgotten about telling her to text him if she wanted to talk. Expecting a much longer message, Izuku was somewhat surprised when he opened his DMs with Hagakure to find the words, Sorry for bailing on you earlier. I hope this makes up for it. With an attached image that could only be unlocked with his fingerprint, suppressing his nerves, Izuku pressed his thumb to the screen, letting it scan his fingerprint before going wide-eyed when he saw what Hagakure had sent him. The image was of a predominantly pink bedroom filled with a startling amount of stuffed animals. More importantly, the central focus of the image was a pale blue brassiere and a pair of panties floating in the air. Of special note was that the brassiere was positioned in such a way that it suggested Hagakure had hiked it up to expose her melons, as Hagakure had been staring daggers at her phone. Waiting for Izuku to open the image, it wasn't long before a follow-up text came asking, What do you think? In a way that somehow conveyed her anxiety, even through text. Coming to his senses, Izuka took a moment to consider his response before typing, I was wrong. You aren't simply beautiful. You're sexy as hell. Though it was very faint, Izuka had noticed that if he looked closely, Hagakure had powdered her melons to make them barely visible. There were no notable details on display, but it was possible to make out the contours of her remarkably full melons. Less than five seconds after his response, Izuku felt a hint of giddiness as Hagakure asked, Would you like some more? Then, without waiting for his response, she sent him another locked attachment, this time showing her panties pulled halfway down her slightly parted thighs. What he didn't know was that she was also using the fingers of her right hand to display something far more tantalizing. He just couldn't see it, as Izuku had always suspected, but very quickly came to learn Hagakure, or more accurately, Toru was a bit of an exhibitionist. It helped that even her sweat, blood, and other bodily fluids were invisible. With Niza's message reaching him on a Saturday, Izuku was one of the only kids at school when he went in for his special training. It was set to occur in one of the forest training zones behind the school, but before making his way over, Izuka stopped by the development studio to drop off tea, coffee, and donuts for Mei and Power Loader. Though she was a little disappointed to learn Izuku, would be too busy to stop by until after the sports festival, Mei quickly forgave him when he gave her the list of materials he had managed to secure orders. He wasn't able to get everything she wanted, but as he had previously given her his 30 million yen toolset, she didn't have any complaints. Izuka had a few, but Mei outright rejected his request to have her call the toolset anything but Papa's Baby Makers. After an unexpectedly long stay in the development studio, the result of Mei forcing him to name their newest children, Izuka made his way to his destination, a vast forest filled with rocky outcrops called Training Ground Omega. There. Standing near the base of a massive observation tower, he quickly spotted the principal, All Might, and the person he presumed had been chosen to aid in his special training. What surprised Izuku was that he recognized said person immediately. Standing at 167 centimeters and possessing a mature figure that simultaneously exuded youthful vigor, the pro chosen to assist in Izuka's special training 
was named Ryuko Tsuchikawa, better known by her hero name, youthful heroine Pixie Bob. As a member of the Wild Wild Pussycats, a cat-themed hero idol group specializing in search and rescue, Pixie Bob's costume resembled the sleeveless top and short skirt combo often worn by idols during stage performances. She also wore a silver headpiece slash visor resembling a cat's ears, oversized cat paw gloves, and a striped blue and white cat tail. With her sharp, intelligent blue eyes, athletic figure, and stylish blonde hair, it wasn't an exaggeration to say she was an exceptionally attractive woman. So much so that Izuka couldn't believe he had disregarded her when he was considering potential partners. Noticing Izuka's approach, Pixie Bob curled her hands up in a cutesy cat pose and remarked, Meow, meow, meow. Is this the little kitten you've prepared to have me teach? He's a little cutie, isn't he? Nodding his head, Niza replied, Midoriya Kuen is a fine young man, and he'll make an exceptional hero. However, please remember that while you're on campus, you are expected to follow the school's provisions and guidelines. We have a very strict policy against teachers dating students, even if they're guest instructors. Dropping her cutesy persona, albeit only for a moment, Pixie Bob clicked her tongue. Because of her catty persona, she was at the age where she had an almost overwhelming desire to find a strong and capable mate. As her name implied, it had taken her much longer than other girls to mature fully, so it wasn't until a few years ago that she began feeling impatient about finding love. The problem was that she was only really attracted to promising young heroes, since she knew any men her age would turn into old farts within a few years. Regaining her usual pep, albeit after licking her lips, Pixie Bob assured, Don't worry, Sensei. I might tease him a bit, but I won't take things too far. Pinky promise. With Pixie Bob extending the pinky finger of her oversized cat gloves, Niza gave it a shake as he said, I trust you, Pixie Bob-san. However, as I have a duty to safeguard my students, I'll have the monitoring devices in the forest operating 24-7. Please keep that in mind. Though her smile cramped, Pixie Bob nevertheless sealed her promise to Nizu. Fortunately, so long as her new kitten wasn't especially promising, she was confident she could suppress her hunger. After all, it wasn't like Izuku was the next All Might or anything. After reaching Nizu, All Might, and Pixie Bob, Izuku was his usual polite self as he said, I apologize for being late. Yesterday's messages caught me unawares, so I had to reorganize my schedule and apologize to those I had made plans with. Adopting a faint smile, Nizu asserted, if anyone should apologize, it's me. I inconvenienced you and your friends and even asked you to come in on your day off. For that, I truly am sorry. Punctuating his words with a slight bow, Nizu did his utmost to convey his sincerity. The truth of the matter was that he rarely took days off. So, there were times when he forgot to factor that in for other people. Izuku was also the type to work on his days off. So Nizu assumed he would be excited, not inconvenienced by the news. Though Nizu's apology made him feel more than a little uncomfortable, Izuku accepted it with humility. The two of them could go back and forth apologizing for minutes on end, but that wasn't why they had gathered at Ground Omega. They were there to increase his level and help acquaint him with the power of one for all. So after a quick round of introductions, that is precisely what they proceeded to do, with Pixie Bob's quirk, Earthflow, allowing her to manipulate, shape, and even program soil to do whatever she wanted, Izuku had a functionally infinite supply of beast-like golems, known as Earth Beasts, to combat for experience. They weren't nearly as intelligent as the clones produced by Ectoplasm, but their sheer numbers had Izuku running around the forest, dodging and counterattacking with a smile on his face. This is insane muttered Izuku, narrowly evading the whip-like tail of an earth dragon. In the same motion, he spun his body, executing a spinning back kick that tore through the dragon's soul-comprised body like a fragile sand castle. Though his attacks were a lot weaker, since he reduced his strength and agility, 
Izuka's elevated intelligence and dexterity more than made up for it. Dexterity was an attribute that influenced a person's senses, balance, and spatial awareness. So Izuka was quickly getting used to controlling the output of One for All on the fly. This was of paramount importance as, fairly early on in his training, he discovered the link between One for All's energy output and his physical attributes. Since One for All only got stronger over time, Izuku could theoretically tap into the full power of All Might whenever he pleased. However, much like the original Izuku, doing so would have disastrous consequences. In the worst case scenario, his limbs would burst apart, forever crippling or outright killing him. To condition his body to accept all of one for all, Izuku had intended to experiment with various stat distributions. As fate would have it, setting his strength and agility to 10 while his vitality was at 100 was the perfect balance of attributes. So long as he didn't exert himself, he could maintain a permanent 10x modifier to all his physical stats. More importantly, as a 10 to 1 ratio was extremely easy to work with, Izuku was able to quantify his limit without the need for guesswork. After some experimentation, Izuku learned that every time his attributes doubled, the burden it placed on his vitality tripled. At 100 strength and agility, a 10x enhanced punch wouldn't have any detrimental impact, but if he increased the multiplier to 20x, he suddenly began hemorrhaging 200 points of vitality every second. If he then doubled his physical attributes a second time, effectively granting him 400 strength and agility, the cost increased to 600 vit per second. Fortunately, whenever Izuka used One for All's power to strengthen his physical attributes, his vitality received twice the amount. A 10x increase in strength, agility, or dexterity would result in a 20x increase in vitality. So if he was smart and only intensified his power at the exact moment before his attacks, he could increase his power to a truly ludicrous extent without needing to fear sequelae. With a base strength and agility of 10 and a vitality of 100, Izuka's current limits were something along the lines of 100 slash 2 0 0 0 no notable side effects. 200 slash 4 0 0 0 200 pps for 20 seconds. 400 slash 8 0 0 0 600 pps for 13 seconds. 800 slash 16 0 0 0 1 800 pps for 8.8 seconds. 1 600 slash 32 0 0 0 5 400 pps for 6 seconds. 3 200 slash 64 0 0 0 16 200 pps for 4 seconds. 6 400 slash 128 0 0 0 48 600 pps for 2 seconds. 12 800 slash 256 0 0 0 145 800 pps for 1 second. While these numbers might seem ridiculous, Izuka knew he still had a long way to go before he was anywhere near All Might's strength in his prime. The man had feats such as guiding a stadium filled with 50,000 people safely to the ground and dispersing a literal tidal wave before it could make landfall. Thus, while increasing his attributes to 12,800 with a meager base of 10 was undeniably insane. Izuka didn't let it get to his head. After all, the boost barely lasted a second, and if he made a mistake in his timing, he was unquestionably in trouble. Having stumbled across the 10 to 1 golden ratio early on, Izuka's best path forward was to grind strength and agility, utilizing the burden one for all placed on his body. He could then repurpose those points for vitality and luck, the former to increase the power he could draw out of one for all, and the latter to bolster his experience gains. Every 10 levels cause the experience between levels to become the total of the previous 10, so it was only a matter of time before he plateaued. Increasing his luck would offset this, but even that wouldn't help him when the experience between levels reached the trillions. A week before the UA Sports Festival, Izuku was advised by Tashinori to take some time off to enjoy Golden Week a period where several national holidays transpired in quick succession. Izuku was hesitant at first, 
as his level had increased significantly in a short period. But he relented fairly quickly when Tashinori pointed out there were several girls that probably wanted to spend time with him. Name, Izuka Midoriya. Quirk, digitalization, transfer, stockpiling, singularity, gear shift, sealed. Fargene, sealed. Danger Sense, sealed. Black Whip, sealed. Smokescreen, sealed. Float, sealed. Current level, 19 to 27. 91,069 to 811,502 EXP. Effective level, 34 to 39. Attributes, strength, 10. Agility, 10. Vitality, 100. Intelligence, 100. Dexterity, 100. Luck, 22 to 75. 40 from levels, 13 from grinding. Free attributes, 0, rerolls available. 2, perks, lesser regeneration, healthy body, sharp mind, eidetic memory, nimble fingers, keen senses, lucky. Though he was hoping to reach level 30 by the time of the sports festival, Izuka was fairly content with his progress. He had confirmed a lot of things during his training, so it was only a matter of time before he attained the strength necessary to achieve his goals. Unfortunately, he wouldn't have Pixie Bob to rely on, as she ultimately had to return to her team. Dismissing such thoughts from his mind, Izuku was staring intently at his phone as he stood outside a movie theater, patiently awaiting the arrival of his date. At a glance, his phone appeared to show a somewhat messy picture of a girl's bed, but if you look closely, you would notice a clear indentation in the mattress surface and the faint outline of a naked lightly powdered girl in some very risque poses. Breaking Izuku from his focused state, the increasingly familiar voice of Toru asked him, Whatcha looking at? Instead of feigning innocent, Izuku revealed his screen to Toru, smiling as he teased. You tell me. Recognizing the photo as the one she had sent shortly after Izuku asked if she wanted to see a movie together, Toru blushed up to her ears and attempted to snatch the phone from his hands. Izuku quickly raised it out of her reach, so she ended up grinding against him for a pleasantly lengthy period before stopping, stamping her feet, and saying, If you're going to bully me, I'm not going to send you any more. Adopting a faint smile, Izuku locked his screen and slid his phone into his pocket. Then, catching Toru by surprise, he took advantage of their close proximity to wrap his arms around her, his smile broadening as he said, I just couldn't wait to see you, so I needed something to keep me occupied until the real deal showed up. Though it was the first time Izuku was touching her outside their training, Toru didn't attempt to break free from his grasp. Instead, she leaned into him. Her invisible face and eyes turned up as she said, I really mean it. If you bully me, I won't forgive you. Interpreting Toru's words as her way of saying he shouldn't play with her feelings, Izuku's smile softened as he whispered, I won't. I promise, in a sincere tone. Pixie Bob's teasing during their training had nearly caused him to pounce, but he managed to endure since it was fairly obvious Toru had caught feelings. He would be fooling himself if he said he felt nothing in turn, so he was ready to make things official if she was. With Izuka strengthening his hold on her body, the fluttery sensation in Toru's chest compounded greatly. If she were being completely honest, she thought things were advancing too quickly. However, as Izuku was the first boy she seriously had a crush on, she eventually closed her eyes and puckered her lips. Unfortunately, Izuku had no way of noticing this, so she ultimately had to summon even more courage to kiss him directly. After returning home from a movie he couldn't even remember the name of, Izuku collapsed in his bed and stared at his ceiling with a completely blank look on his face. He and Toru hadn't made things official with their words, but they held hands throughout the movie, and he even walked her home, the complete opposite direction of his after the fact. Recalling the parting kiss Toru had gifted him, the listless look on Izuka's face gradually gave way to a smile. It was chaste and very brief, but the feelings within weren't lacking. He could tell that Toru like liked him, so most of his short-term plans came crashing down around him. He would still accept an internship with Mirko if she gave him the option, but now, even if he did have a chance with her, it seemed fate had other ideas. 
Beezy Zizi feeling his phone buzz in his pocket. Izuku was unsurprised to find a message originated from Toru. Seeing it caused the smile on his face to broaden, but the moment he opened it up, his expression became fixed like a statue. Sorry, Izuku kun but I don't think I'm ready to take our relationship to the next level. Spending time with you makes me the happiest I've ever been, but I know there are a lot of girls in our class who like you. Going around behind their backs and sending you lewd photos makes me feel like I've stolen you away from them. So, at least for the time being, I think we should remain good friends. If you're still single come winter break, I promise to confess to you properly then. After reading the message multiple times, Izuka hesitated for a moment before replying, I understand. I also know this couldn't have been easy for you, so I won't make things harder by trying to convince you. Instead, if we're both still available come New Year's, I'll give you a lot more than a simple confession. Finished with his message, Izuku pressed send before tossing his phone aside. He had heard that high school romances were filled with drama, but this was beyond his expectations. It almost felt like Toru had betrayed him, but he knew that wasn't a fair assessment. On the contrary, she was giving him a chance to figure things out before their relationship crossed a point that couldn't be backpedaled. It was a sensible decision from a girl who very clearly had intense feelings for him, so Izuka did his best not to overthink things as he got out of bed, sat at his desk, set his headphones to their max volume, and got to work securing his future. Reading Izuka's response, the tears that Toru had barely been able to get under control came back in full. Breaking things off with Izuku was one of the hardest things she had ever done, but she couldn't stand the feeling of having betrayed the other girls in Class 1A. It was obvious to her that Achiko Tsuyu and even Yairozu had feelings for Izuko, so she didn't think it was fair to them that she had gotten close to him while they were distracted and preparing for the sports festival. There was also the girl named Mei Hatsum, who Toru had secretly approached while Izuku was conducting his special training. So, even if it pained her heart, she did her best to push down her feelings for everyone else's happiness. Author's note, I'm aware that the MC could increase the potential for attribute gains and the ratio for multiplication if he decreased his base str slash agi even further, but I'm running with the premise that he needs at least a certain degree of physicality to make use of one for all at all. With the conclusion of Golden Week, the day of the UA Sports Festival had finally arrived. Class 1, A had been asked to gather in a waiting room so they could step out onto the field together. So Izuku promptly headed that way after getting changed into his gym uniform. As usual, Izuku was one of the very first to arrive, appearing second only to Yairozu. When she noticed him entering, her expression blossomed into a smile as she commented, You're looking especially focused today, Midoriya Cohen. I take it you're satisfied with the preparations you made for the sports festival. Adopting a smile of his own, Izuku confidently replied, I'm planning to take first in the entire event, but let's both give it our all. Extending his fist for a bump, the corners of Izuku's smile curled upward when Yairozu initially just stared at it. When she eventually realized his intentions, the faintest of blushes colored her cheeks as she reciprocated the gesture and replied, Yes, let's give it our all, as for your declaration of claiming first. I won't make things easy for you. Retracting his hand, Izuka remarked, I would be disappointed if you did. I trained hard for this day. Noticing a familiar figure enter the waiting room, Izuka's words gradually trailed off as his gaze met Toru's. He couldn't actually see her face, but he was certain their gazes had met since she abruptly stopped, standing stock still in the entrance. Following Izuka's gaze, Yairozu, Seemingly unaware of the sudden tension, beamed as she said, Oh, Hagakure san Midoriya Kuen, and I were discussing the sports festival. He claims he'll be taking first place, so let's both do our best to stop him. Freed from her stupor, Toru pumped her fists and replied, Of course, I trained super duper extra hard for today's festival, so I won't be yielding the crown that easily. Seeing Toru back to her usual self, or at least pretending to be, 
Izuku felt obliged to play along, regaining his smile as he said, Then I'll have to do my best. With that said, Izuku, Yairozu, and Toru made casual conversation until their remaining classmates began trickling in. Izuku thought of separating himself from the duo once another girl arrived, but he became stuck when Achiko, Tsuyu, and Mina entered the waiting room together. He had been radio silent the latter half of Golden Week, so Mina, in particular, had a lot of questions she wanted answers to before she was willing to let him go. Now, let's hear a ripping round of applause for our first year students, starting with the Department of Heroes, Class 1A. Prompted by present mix introduction, Izuku and the rest of his class made their way out onto a circular grass field, surrounded by a stadium packed to the brim with well over 50,000 people. Since many of his classmates were nervous about having so many eyes on them, Izuku gave them at least a basic idea of what they should be doing by raising his hand, smiling, and waving. The entire purpose of the sports festival was to show off, appeal to pro heroes, and impress future sponsors. Displaying confidence and making a good first impression was nearly as important as your actual performance. Following Class 1A's entrance, Class 1B from the Hero Course, Classes 1C, D, and E from the General Course, Classes 1F, G, H from the Support Course, and Classes 1I, J, and K from the Business Course made their way onto the field. There was very little fanfare for the General, Support, and Business Classes, but Class 1B was nearly as popular as 1A due to the latter having no real hand in repelling the villains during the attack on USJ. Once each of the classes had taken their positions midnight, wearing her incredibly scant hero costume, made her way onto the field, climbing the stairs to an elevated platform as the crowd and many among the students celebrated her arrival. After reaching the microphone that had been prepared for her, Midnight flicked her leather BDSM whip and shouted, Silence everyone! It's now time for the student pledge. As for the representative of the first years, I call Izuka Midoriya to the stage. Blinking in surprise, countless thoughts invaded Izuka's mind, chief among them being, what the hell? Followed by, shouldn't it be Todoroki? Or another one of the referral students. Despite the many questions appearing in his mind, Izuka made his way up to the stage with a practiced, casual, and confident smile. He wasn't one of the people who feared public speaking, but he would be lying if he said it wasn't a little unnerving to be the focus of tens of thousands of people, and that was just in the stands. The international viewership of the sports festival exceeded 300 million, so there were a lot of eyes on him. Making his way up to the prepared microphone, Izuku raised his gaze to the crowd, forcibly maintaining his mask as he considered what he should say. He was ultimately the representative of all the first years present. So while it was tempting to say something arrogant, doing so would come at the cost of his public image and rapport. After a brief moment of consideration, aided by his combined intelligence and dexterity, Izuka calmly stated, Though it's only been a month since we became students at UA, everyone here is giving it their all to carve a path toward their future. While the hero course is undoubtedly the focus of today's events, please show some consideration for those in the other departments. In a world where quirks make anything possible, physical fitness and combat proficiency are not the only metrics for talent. Please keep that in mind. Punctuating his speech with a bow, Izuku was relieved when the crowd practically erupted. Humility, especially in the strong, was a trait that was greatly appreciated by the public. If Izuku was going to become the number one pro in the future, even if only for a short while, he needed to have at least some awareness of how others perceived him. Pressing a button in her palm that disabled the mic, Midnight surprised Izuku by remarking, My, aren't you a little cutie? Before punctuating her words with a playful wink. Now get off the stage so we can proceed with the first event. Responding with a curt nod, Izuku descended from the stage and retook his place among the students of Class 1A. They were asked to stand in order of their seating chart, so Yairozu was only two spaces behind him, ignoring the fact Mineta was between them as she said, That was an incredible speech, Midoriya Kuen. 
I understand why you were chosen as the representative of all the first years. Speaking from Izuka's right, Siro added, Yeah, if it were me, I would have tried showing off to market myself. Guess I still have a lot to learn before becoming a pro, ha. Huh. Adopting a faint smile, Izuka replied, We all do, before adding, Also, we should probably quiet down. Midnight Sensei is glaring at us. As she could hear Izuka's remark, Midnight narrowed her blue eyes in amusement before flipping on her mic and shouting, Without further ado, it's time to get started. The first game is what you call a qualifier. In other words, this is where you begin feeling the pain. Striking a pose with her whip, a holographic display appeared behind Midnight, a roulette-like will appearing on the screen as she mused. The first game of the festival is... What could it be? In response to Midnight's words, the roulette abruptly came to a stop, revealing the words, Obstacle Race in big, bold letters. At the same time, Midnight snapped her whip and exclaimed, Tada! The first event will be an obstacle race. The track is a four-kilometer obstacle course that runs around the stadium. Directing a narrow-eyed gaze to the students below, Midnight licked her lips and added, I don't want to restrain anyone, at least not in this game. As long as you don't leave the course, everyone here is free to do as their heart desires. Now then, take your places, contestants. It's time to show everyone here what you can do. As the crowd erupted in response to Midnight's words, the 11 first-year classes raced to be the first at the starting point. Those with keen eyes and common sense could see that the opening wasn't very wide, so if you found yourself at the back of the pack, you would need to wait for everyone else to get through before doing so yourself. Contrasting the frenzy of the other students, Izuku intentionally took his time reaching the gate. What he didn't anticipate, though he really should have, was for his actions to draw the attention of some of his classmates. More specifically, Achiko and Tsuyu came over to him, the latter taking the initiative to ask, What's up, Izuka-chan? Don't you want to get a good position at the gate? Adding to Tsuyu's words, Achiko exclaimed, Yeah, if we don't hurry and take our positions, we'll end up getting entangled like the students during the evacuation. Understanding that the duo was compromising their placements out of concern for him, Izuka's smile broadened as he replied, Thanks for your concern, but I won't have any trouble getting through the gate. And if you combine your powers, I bet the two of you can leap over the entire group in a single bound. Touching her bottom lip out of habit, Tsuyu asked, Is that even allowed? I know Midnight Sensei, I said... We could do whatever we wanted, but this is still a competition. Teaming up feels like cheating. Shaking his head, Izuku asserted, This might be a competition, but it's also an opportunity for us to demonstrate the types of heroes we wish to become. Most of the scouts won't be looking for hot-headed powerhouses that can sweep through a group of villains in the blink of an eye. I imagine the vast majority will be searching for capable and cooperative individuals they can potentially groom into sidekicks. That makes a lot of sense, remarked Tsuyu. Spurred by Izuka's words, Achiko's face blossomed into a smile as she asked, If that's the case, then why don't the three of us team up? If we work together, I'm certain we can sweep through the competition. Adopting a markedly wryer smile, Izuku explained, I would like that. But there's just one problem. What's that? Asked Achiko, tilting her head curiously. I'm a guy and the two of you are cute girls, explained Izuko. If I were to carry you or run with you on my back, nearly every male in the stadium would come to resent me. Ah, uh, envisioning the scene of her clinging to Izuku as he ran at full speed, a faint blush colored Achiko's perpetually blushing cheeks. As for Tsuyu, she offered one of her characteristic kuras before pointing out, Maybe, but it's a good way to show people you're capable of performing rescues. Being able to transport people to safety is an important skill for a hero to have. That's especially true for people with reinforcement quirks, Ribbit. Realizing there was a considerable amount of truth to Tsuyu's words, Izuka paused for a moment before adopting a broad smile and saying, 
If that's the case, I wouldn't mind carrying the two of you to the finish line. But won't that be pretty embarrassing? Without so much as a second of deliberation, Sue so replied, I don't really mind, Ribbit. This is just the first round of the sports festival, so we'll have plenty of chances to show off if we perform well in this event. Emboldened by Tsuyu's words, Achiko pumped her fists in a guts pose as she appended, Let's do this! with a resolute smile. The thought of being carried by a boy on international television honestly scared her. However, since the boy in question was Izuku, she was, for reasons she didn't fully understand, more excited than afraid. What the hell is that? Are you freaking kidding me? Lucky bastard. Though most of the contestants were focused on the gate in front of them, patiently awaiting the starting countdown, those stuck at the back of the group, who were already annoyed, couldn't help feeling even more annoyed after witnessing Izuku's, Achiko's, and Tsuyu's lovey-dovey display. Since Tsuyu was the smaller of the two, not that it mattered too much with Achiko's zero-gravity quirk, Izuku was cradling her in a princess carry while Achiko floated behind him, her blushing face next to his and her arms wrapped around his neck and chest. She had made herself functionally weightless, but Izuku could still feel her admittedly sizable melons pressing into his shoulders as he focused intently on the three lights above the gate. This is way more embarrassing than I expected, muttered Achiko. However, despite her words, her hold on Izuku strength, the result of the lights above the gate, glowing green before slowly disappearing as a countdown. Though Achiko was already doing precisely that, Izuka said, hold on tighter, as he leaned forward slightly, increasing the amount of energy being channeled through his body. He wouldn't be able to take off like a rocket as he originally planned, but he could gradually ramp up his speed until not even Ida could hope to compete. As the final light blinked out, Izuku quickly closed the distance he had created between himself and the people at the back of the pack, picking up just enough speed so that when he kicked off against the ground, he leaped over the clumping students. At that exact same moment, Achiko used her power to make him weightless, allowing them to effectively fly through the corridor while most students could only look up at them with envy. The operative word being most. While Todoroki created an ice field, using it to trip up other students and accelerate forward, a certain ashen-haired blonde borrowed a page from Izuka's book, propelling himself through the air using the explosions from his palms as he bellowed, You scheming bastard! Don't think I'll stand by and allow you to keep showing off. Though he recognized the voice as Bakugo, Izuku didn't bother to look back, muttering, Release your quirk! and then reapply it to yourself. I'm going to speed up. In a voice only Tsuyu and Achiko could hear. Obeying Izuku's instructions, Achiko pressed the pads of her fingers together, canceling her quirk before reapplying it to herself before they landed. The frozen terrain allowed them to keep their forward momentum, but Izuku wasn't satisfied with just skating along. The moment he landed, he channeled the energy of one for all through his saws, fracturing the ground beneath him as he propelled himself forward with blinding speed. He made sure to limit himself so that Achiko didn't lose her hold on him, but it was still fast enough to leave most sports cars in the dust. What? Though he was able to propel himself using his ice, Todoroki's physical parameters weren't much higher than a peak human's. Thus, the moment Izuku overtook him, there was little the heterochromatic red and white-haired youth could do but stare in awe as the gap between him and Izuku became unbridgeable in an instant. Liberating Todoroki from his stupor, Bakugo quickly caught up to him shouting, Get out of my way, you icy bastard! Reaching the point in the course where the path opened up quite a bit, Izuku's eyes narrowed as more than a dozen zero-pointers, accompanied by an assortment of one, two, and three-point villain bots, appeared to obstruct their path. If he were alone, Izuku would have capitalized on the opportunity to get his vengeance against the zero-pointer he was powerless against during the entrance exam. Instead, he kicked against the ground with explosive strength, doubling his speed to nearly 100 meters per second for a brief moment. Barely managing to hold on, Achiko closed her eyes and screamed, 
I don't think I can hold on for much longer, at the top of her lungs. Fortunately, Tsuyu was able to hear this, prompting her to use her long, strong, and incredibly elastic tongue to wrap around Achiko's body. After passing beneath the zero pointers in an instant, Izuka gradually reduced his speed to a more comfortable level saying, Sorry about that, Achiko-san. Fortunately, it looks like the next obstacle was tailor-made for our combination of quirks. Tentatively opening her eyes, Achiko's body tensed when she saw them approaching a massive pit with rocky platforms linked together by ropes. What the heck? How was Yue able to prepare something like this on such short notice? exclaimed Achiko. Envisioning a blonde-haired, cat-themed heroine, Izuku remarked, With the power of quirks, anything is possible. Speaking of which, you should probably reduce mine and Tsuchan's weights. Instead of slowing down, Izuku began ramping up his speed once again. This time, however, the acceleration was markedly more gradual, making things much easier for Achiko as she used her right hand to pat Tsuyu's head. Karo, with Tsuyu's weight disappearing, Izuku abruptly sped up before leaping into the air, controlling his strength to ensure he didn't jump too high. The simulated canyon was about 200 m across, but with Achiko making him weightless at the pinnacle of his arc, they were able to clear it in a single bound. Though it took less than three seconds to clear the canyon, Izuku had enough time to think, I should look into methods to awaken my other quirks. Float would be incredible once I master maneuvering through the air with shockwaves. With the final obstacle being a minefield, they could simply fly over. No one was surprised when Izuka's group took first place in the obstacle race. There was a bit of contention about who should be the true first place, but as Izuku had literally carried them through the event, neither Achiko nor Tsuyu contested the title. As for second, Tsuyu yielded it to Achiko, since her quirk was what allowed them to overcome most of the obstacles. The only thing she did were curl up in Izuka's arms and use her tongue like a safety harness. Arriving a few minutes after Izuka's group, crossing the finish line at nearly the same time as Todoroki, Bakugo glowered at the former but didn't say anything. Instead, he stuck his hands in his pockets and moved off to the side, clearly in a bad mood but not wanting to make too much of a scene. Though he noticed Bakugo's actions, Izuku didn't pay him too much mind. He had used one for all to amplify his power by 20 and 30 times during the obstacle race, so he was taking a break to recuperate his lost vit. More accurately, he was chatting with Achiko and Tsuyu at the water station until Todoroki approached him to say, You've gotten faster, with his usual borderline expressionless face and tone. Raising his brows, Izuku asked, as opposed to what? Getting slower? Did you think I just played around these past few weeks? Leaving Izuku a little speechless, Todoroki gave an affirming nod, stating, That's what it seemed like to me. I heard from the others that you spent most of your time doing basic training at the gym and loitering around the support department's development studio. Was that some kind of ploy to get us to lower our guards? Adopting a slightly annoyed look, Izuku asked, If it were, would there be any merit in me telling you? Shaking his head, Todoroki replied, I suppose not. Either way, first place in this year's sports festival is bound to be mine. I wish you luck securing second. Finished with what he had to say, Todoroki turned around and walked away with a resolute look on his face. If Izuku was the original, he might have attempted to stop him. Instead, he just shook his head, waiting for the icy hot youth to get out of listening distance before continuing his conversation with Achiko and Tsuyu. They were currently speculating what the second event would be based on information from past sports festivals. Tsuyu, somewhat surprisingly, landed on the right answer from the beginning, but despite knowing this, Izuka still agreed that if one of them were correct, the other two would have to obey one request issued by the winner. By the end of the obstacle race, 47 students had qualified for the second round. Most, unsurprisingly, originated from the hero course, but there were a few outliers from the general and support courses. 
This included a salmon-haired inventress, who, after spotting Izuku, bolted over to him, exclaiming, How come you never told me you were so fast? Wait, now that I think about it, you never did tell me what your quirk was, did you? Before Izuku could respond, Achiko, with a somewhat guarded look on her face, asked, Who's this girl, Izuku Kuin? The two of you seem pretty familiar with one another. Answering in Izuku's stead, May puffed out her chest, emphasized by the harness she was wearing, declaring, I'm May Hatsum, Izuku Kuin and I make babies together when he isn't busy with classes or training. Though he expected May's response, Izuku was still left speechless. As for Achiko and Tsuyu, they both looked toward him with narrowed eyes, the latter questioning, Don't you think it's a little too early for things like that, Izuku-chan? In a judgmental tone. Adopting a deadpan expression, Izuku asked, Just what do you think of me? Before clarifying, The babies May is referring to are her inventions. I sponsor her with materials, and the two of us share a workstation in the support department's development studio. Providing Izuku some relief, May nodded in affirmation, stating, That's right. And since they're babies that Izuku helped me build, that makes him the father of invention and me the mother. Pretty awesome, right? Realizing they had misjudged the situation, Tsuyu hung her head slightly and muttered, Sorry, Izuku-chan. While Achiko just stared at Mei as if she were a strange, unidentified organism. Shaking his head, Izuku said, It's fine. I'm not the type to take Miss Sun, Dash, interrupting Izuka's response, Midnight. Standing atop the same stage as before, shouted, Students who triumphed during the preliminaries, stand before me. I will now be explaining the rules for the second event, with everyone shuffling over in response to Midnight's instructions. Izuku adopted a wry smile and suggested, Let's make our way over, and good luck with your predictions. Hmm... Hearing Izuka mention predictions, May moved closer to him, standing well within his personal space as they walked along, asking, What's this about a prediction? Did the three of you make a bet? Nodding his head, Izuku was about to explain the terms of their bet, when Achiko abruptly grabbed his hand, pulling him along as she shouted, We don't have time for this! We need to hurry up and join the others! With Achiko utilizing her quirk to force his compliance, Izuku blinked several times in surprise as he thought, Was she always this prone to jealousy? Or did I overdo it when I pulled some strings to get her family a government contract? With Achiko refusing the phone, he tried to gift her at the last moment. Izuku made good on his promise to uncover the reason for her inability to upgrade her flip phone. It turned out her parents, or more accurately, the construction company they owned, had been saddled with debt after a workplace accident resulted in them being sued for negligence. Izuka lacked the means to pay off their nearly 300 million yen debt, but he was able to convince Nizu to pull some strings to secure them some work. Izuka hadn't told Achiko any of this, but he wouldn't be surprised if she had figured it out when her parents told her the good news. After all, it occurred only three days after she rejected his offer. Once everyone had gathered around, Midnight revealed what the second event would be, surprising everyone, but Izuku, as she explained, as some of you have very clearly realized, teamwork and a spirit of cooperation are among the most important traits of a pro hero. As such, the second event is one of the favorites of the UA High Sports Festival, the heart-pounding human cavalry battle. From her position next to Izuku, Tsuya's eyes widened as she remarked, I guess correctly, in a disbelieving tone. As Midnight had pointed out, the human cavalry battle was one of the more common events at the UA High Sports Festival. But Tsuya was still surprised since it meant she had won her bet with Izuku and Achiko. Hearing Tsuya's utterance, a teasing smile developed across Izuka's face as he whispered, Just don't request anything inappropriate, opening her eyes even wider. Tsuyu was about to assert she would never do such a thing, but stopped when she noticed Izuku wasn't staring back at her. He, like most of the other students, was paying close attention to Midnight's explanation. So Tsuyu swallowed her grievances and did the same. Much like the canon he was familiar with, Izuku was given a headband with a point value of 10 million. 
Unlike the original, however, Izuku wasn't lacking in people who were willing to team up with him. Rather, the moment Midnight afforded them 15 minutes to find up to three team members may ask the obvious, I guess that means the four of us will form a team? Though he didn't mind forming a team with the three girls, Izuka pointed out, that's fine by me, but it might be better if we split up for this leg of the competition. Working together during multiple events could make the scouts believe we're a package deal. If that doesn't bother you, we can have Suyu chan as our rider. With how skilled she is with her tongue, she should be able to snatch multiple headbands with ease. Hearing Izuka comment on her tongue skills, a potent blush developed through Tsuyu's cheeks. Her expression didn't change, but she pulled the usually dangling tip of her tongue back into her mouth with a flip. Appreciating Izuka's choice of words, May held her stomach and laughed heartily before remarking, I always knew we were kindred spirits, Izuka Kuen. Feigning ignorance, a bewildered look marred Izuka's face as he asked, What? Did I say something strange? Intruding on the conversation, before any of the three girls could respond, the towering, six-armed shoji appeared rather abruptly, directing his gaze to Tsuyu as he said, If the four of you have yet to form a team, would you mind joining mine? With my arms as a shield, we should be able to protect and snatch headbands easily. Not expecting someone other than Izuku to approach her, Tsuyu found herself in a difficult position. She didn't like disappointing others, so she hated being placed in situations where she had to choose between two or more people. Instead of directly responding to Shoji's request, Tsuyu shifted her gaze to Achiko, asking, What will you do, Achiko-chan? Blinking in surprise, Achiko pointed to herself and asked, Me? I'm going to team up with izuka Kuen. I mean, we still have... Two more years to prove ourselves to the scouts. I don't mind if I don't stand out much right now. I just want to give it my all alongside my friends. Karo, turning her attention to Shoji, Tsuyu adopted an apologetic expression as she said, Sorry, Shoji Kuen. I'm going to continue teaming up with Achiko and Izuka chan for the sports festival ribbit. I understand, replied Shoji. Then, with a wave of his right hand and tentacles, he turned to leave, adding, I wish the four of you the best of luck during the remaining events, as he returned to his other teammate's side. When Tsuyu saw it was Mineta, goose pimples spread across her body as she imagined being trapped in Shoji's arms alongside a class pervert. Then it looks like everything's decided, exclaimed Mei. However, before she could suggest distributing her gear across their team, Another person showed up, Toru, in her gym uniform, sounding audibly nervous. Toru bent forward slightly, her hands behind her back as she asked, Um, if it isn't too much to ask, can I join your team? While staring up at Izuku, sparing Izuku the need to respond, at least for the moment, Achiko smiled apologetically as she expressed, Sorry, Hagakure-san, but our team already has four members. You could try asking Kotokuin or Sadokuin if they need a fourth. Oh, I see, replied Toru. She already suspected the four had formed a team when she noticed them together, but a part of her hoped that Izuku would make a concession for her sake. It was really difficult to stand out with a quirk like invisibility, so attaching herself to a high-profile team like Izuka's was one of her only options. Catching all four girls by surprise, Izuku exhaled a faint sigh through his nose before saying, Sorry, Mei-san, but can you please let Toru-san take your place? I promise to make it up to you later. While Toru was surprised to the point of tearing up, Mei didn't hesitate to respond, Sure thing, in a chipper tone. I mean, the only reason support students participate in events like this is to attract sponsors. I can do the same during the school festival a few months from now so it's no sweat off my brow. Besides, I already have a sug. I mean, I already have you to sponsor me. Without waiting for Izuku to respond, my followed Shoji's example by abruptly leaving the moment she was finished speaking. There were only 10 minutes left until the second round started, so she needed to find a few teammates suckers to help promote her support items. After following Mei's departure with his eyes, 
Izuku turned to Toru, his smile tinged with a certain gentleness as he said, Be sure to thank Mei the next time you see her, okay? As she was too busy covering her mouth to stifle her faint sobbing, Toru just nodded in response to Izuka's words. Achiko and Tsu both noticed this abnormality, but instead of drawing attention to it or asking what was wrong, they politely feigned ignorance. Though Tsuyu was indisputably their best option for their rider-slash-headband snatcher, she relinquished the role to Toru without needing to be asked. It was obvious to her why Toru needed to be on a team like Izuka's, so she and Achiko served as the back-end supports while Izuka functioned as the horse. To make it more difficult for their opponents to snatch their headbands, Toru did the same thing she did in the anime, removing her top and bra so that her upper body was invisible. While this seemed incredibly risque, it actually provided two benefits. The first was that the enemy couldn't see her hands, allowing her to snatch headbands more easily. The second, far more significant benefit was that most of the male participants wouldn't even attempt to grab her headband. After all, if they missed and touched something they shouldn't, they risked being labeled a pervert. Despite feeling something occasionally graze the top of his head, Izuka's expression was a mask of intense focus as he eagerly awaited the start of the match. The rules prohibited participants from deliberately attempting to trip or knock down other teams. Because of this, Izuku had positioned his team near the very edge of the area, intending to stand his ground and crush anyone that came their way. After all, with 10,425 points, they weren't exactly hurting for more. With similarly intense looks on their faces, virtually every other team in the second event's cavalry battle had their eyes on the 10,425-point headband around Toru's head. This was especially true for the teams led by Bakuto and Todoroki, both enthusiastic, maybe even a little desperate, to show their worth. Now, without further ado, let the final countdown begin. 3, 2. As midnight started the final countdown from 3, Izuka's expression hardened as he muttered, Remember, our goal is absolute victory. We will not give a single centimeter. Right, replied the three girls, albeit with varying degrees of excitement and nervousness. Achiko had proposed they avoid combat by flying into the air, but Izuku insisted they remain on the ground. Tashinori had asked him to exhibit his power, much like he had petitioned Deku in the original series, so Izuka didn't have the option of running. Not because it was a request from Tashinori, but because he refused to lose to a bunch of brats when monsters like All for One awaited him in the future. 1. Back off, you extras! That 10 million headband is mine! The moment Midnight finished her countdown, Bakugo abandoned his team and charged at Izuko, propelling himself through the air with his explosions. His actions could be seen as a violation of the rules, but so long as contestants didn't touch the ground or purposely knock off their opponents, pretty much anything was allowed. Narrowing his eyes, Izuku said, Tsuchan, don't let Toru fall, as he began channeling energy into his right leg. In response to his words, not only did Tsu wrap her tongue around Toru's waist, the latter sat on the two girls' shoulders for support, allowing Izuku a greater range of motion as he raised his foot in a faux Muay Thai pose, waiting until Bakugo was within his range before extending his foot like a spring. Though Bakugo was among the students with the highest level, his quirk was an emission type. It very clearly enhanced his body when in use, but compared to Izuku, whose attributes could briefly exceed 10,000, there was an incomprehensible gulf between them. If Izuka didn't arrest his foot's momentum mere centimeters away from Bakugo's face, repelling him with pure wind pressure, he might have kicked the boy's head clean off. What the hell? screamed Bakugo, barely gaining control of his body after flipping several times through the air. Once he had... A mixture of fear and anger reflected in his crimson eyes as he looked at Izuka, unable to understand how a boy that had once followed him around like a homeless puppy was so powerful, lowering his foot. Izuka's voice was loud enough that everyone paying attention to him was able to hear as he borrowed a page out of Tashinori's book, 
declaring, You will not get your hands on this headband? Why, you ask. Because I am. Here, realizing that Izuku was mimicking his hero, All Might, Bakugo's explosion-like hair became noticeably spikier as he shouted, Deco! in a blind rage, propelling himself forward like a rocket. Bakugo looked like he was ready to blast Izuku directly with his quirk. Instead, just out of range of Izuku's kick, he performed an abrupt spinning maneuver, creating a smokescreen with his explosions before propelling himself through the wall of flames in an attempt to get his hands on the 10,425-point headband. Doing so left him with slight burns on his face. But he wasn't phased as he shouted, This belongs to me! in furious triumph. Instead of trying to block Bakugo's attack, Toru left the Ashen Blonde speechless by dodging backward, effectively rolling off of Achiko's and Tsuyu's shoulders, trusting that the latter wouldn't let her hit the ground. As a result, Bakugo flew clean over her, his hand momentarily following in the direction of her movement before he clicked his tongue and retracted it. After all, while he was known for his explosive temperament, he wasn't a pervert, though he still intended to get his hands on the 10,425-point headband. Bakugo temporarily had to retreat since his forearms were beginning to cramp due to overusing his quirk. With the pressure off of them, at least for a moment, Tsuyu and Achiko helped Toru right herself. In the process, two very soft objects touched the back of his head, as Toru exhaled a sigh of relief and said, That was terrifying, in a slightly shaken tone. Maintaining his focus, Izuka said, It's not over yet. Even Mineta's quirk can be troublesome if utilized properly, so let's stay on our toes. As if in response to Izuka's words, the ground beneath them began to soften like thick mud, the result of a somewhat scary-looking youth with teeth on the outside of his mouth utilizing his quirk. However, instead of attacking, it was a completely different group, comprised entirely of girls from Class 1B, that made a push for the 10,425-point headband. Supported by a gloomy-looking girl with gray hair, a green-haired girl with pointed teeth, and a diminutive girl with mushroom-like brown hair, a very sporty-looking girl with teal eyes and orange hair tied in a side ponytail on the left side of her head shouted, Sorry about colluding, but we can't let Class 1A hog all the limelight, while growing her right hand to the size of a car door. Though he only remembered that the orange-haired girl was named Kendo, Izuku had a vague impression of the other three girls' quirks, shouting, Secure the headband! as he kicked some of the mud like goop around his feet at the approaching girls. Others might have trouble moving in the swamp-like environment, but it gave Izuku a much-needed way to repel attacking enemies. Using her oversized hand, Kendo managed to block most of Izuka's surprise attack by leaning forward and covering her horses, Yanagi's face and upper body. The lower halves of the three girls supporting her got muddy, but as aspiring pro heroes, it would take more than a bit of dirt and grime to deter them. What Kendo hadn't anticipated was that while she was busy protecting her team, a whip-like tongue would come out of nowhere snatching her headband and inadvertently unfastening her ponytail. Amidst the confusion, Izuka said, Sorry, but I'm not the only capable person on our team. You'll need to do much better than that if you want to steal our headband. Punctuating his statement, Izuka leaped into the air, aided by Achiko, using her quirk to make herself, Tsuyu, and Toru functionally weightless. He had no intentions of staying in the air, but the liquefied terrain would become an extreme detriment if someone like Ciro, Mineta, or the glue-spewing member of Class 1B showed up. As if reading Izuka's mind, the team comprised of Mina, Ciro, Kurishima, and Takoyami came charging at them the moment they landed. Mina was the group's rider, Kurishima was the horse, and Takoyami and Ciro were in the somewhat enviable position of providing support, with the former being able to harden his body and the latter two's quirks allowing them to manipulate a powerful shadow beast and exceptionally durable tape, they were an exceptionally powerful combination, unleashing a veritable torrent of viscous, pH-neutral acid Mina, smiling like an imp, exclaimed, Sorry, Izuku, Achiko, Tsuyu, and Toruchan, but this is a competition after all. 
No hard feelings, okay? I hope you feel the same way, shouted Izuku, kicking his foot out to repel Mina's acid with a blast of wind pressure. As a result, the acid goop intended for his team ended up covering Mina's. Seeing the latter covered in a viscous liquid was a fairly captivating sight, but the same couldn't be said for the boys. In fact, Izuka felt genuinely apologetic towards Siro and Tokoyami when he saw the two of them with deadpan, slightly accusatory looks on their faces. As for Kurishima, Izuka felt like he had done the boy a favor since he currently had an excited grin on his face. Detu conveniently announcing his presence. Bakugo came charging at Izuku and his group for the second, or was it the third time? Either way, Izuku was starting to get annoyed as the cavalry event was far more limiting to his abilities than he expected. If he had selected just a single teammate to give a piggyback ride specifically to you, they would have been able to dart around the battlefield, potentially snatching every other headband. I really need to awaken Black Whip, thought Izuku, turning to meet Bakugo with a fierce resolution on his face. However, what awaited him the moment he turned around was a desolate landscape, enveloped by a storm-like swirl of purple energy looking down at his body, enveloped by a dark green haze, veiling what appeared to be glowing green pathways reminiscent of a circuit board, Izuka thought. I really must have inherited the fate of the protagonist. This timing is way too convenient. Hey you. The ninth wielder. Turning his head, Izuku found a large muscular man with a bald head, square jaw, and beady blue eyes walking toward him. He looked like a generic street thug or a biker at first glance, especially with his leather jacket, pants, boots, and a bandolier around his chest. But he gave off a strangely friendly aura despite shouting. Even if that quirk of yours is super amazing, you can't become complacent. The easier things are for you. The harder you need to work, the moment you let your guard down, that's it. You're done. Opening his mouth, Izuku attempted to speak, but found himself unable to. The bald man, seemingly noticing this, adopted an uncanny yet gentle smile as he said, You won't be able to act freely in this place just yet. The power inside of you, the singularity serving as the core of one for all, has only just begun to stir. I'd like to explain more, but I don't have much time. For now, let's focus on my quirk. Raising his right hand, palm up, the thug-like man generated several tendrils of black, teal-tinged energy as he explained. This is Black Whip, an emission-type quirk that allows you to produce and manipulate energy tendrils from any part of your body. Like most emission quirks, the power of Black Whip is heavily influenced by your mental and emotional state. To master this power, you'll need to be calm and collected in even the direst circumstances. Do not lose yourself to anger or hatred, as no matter how effective they are as a fuel source, they consume your body and mind just as much as they empower your quirk. Following his words, the thug-like man placed his fingers against Izuka's chest, sinking into the dark green swirl of energy comprising his form as he said, Listen, kid. Alongside mine, you'll have six more quirks manifest within you. The power they grant you will be tremendous, but don't worry. If you ever find yourself straying or backed into a corner, we'll be here to pull you back from the brink and guide you back to the light. You are not alone. Accompanying the man's words, several silhouettes appeared in the hazy purple storm at his back. Izuku couldn't make out their features, but the moment they appeared, a surge of positive emotions flowed through him, the most powerful among them being trust. Izuku-kun, what are you doing? Snap out of it, shouted Toru, breaking Izuku from his apparent daze just in time to see Bakugo snatch away the 10,425-point headband. Grinning like a demon, Bakugo bellowed, Way to space out in the middle of a fight, dweeb. Good luck getting enough points to pass now. While using his free hand to propel himself away, feeling what he could best describe as a cold fury swelling from within him, Izuku forced himself to remain calm, inhaling a deep breath before adopting a smile and saying, Sorry, 
but I'm not the extra here, as a series of black tendrils erupted from his chest. What the hell? exclaimed Bakugo, before hastily placing the 10,425-point headband in his mouth to increase his mobility. Using several additional tendrils to grasp each of the girls, Izuka leaped into the air, shouting, That's against the rules. Stolen headbands need to be placed around the head or neck. Cough it up, explosion boy. With Izuku closing the distance between them in an instant, Bakugo exclaimed, Crap! in his mind. However, as there was some truth to Izuka's words, he also spat out the headband, screaming, Just try and take it from me! as he flipped to avoid Izuka's charge, using the brief window to place the headband around his neck. Unfortunately, while Bakugo's aerial maneuverability and athleticism were a sight to behold, he was effectively quirkless while placing the headband around his neck. As a result, he could only clench his teeth as Black Whip's energy tendrils enveloped him, forming a spherical cocoon. Izuku couldn't permanently entrap him, as it would likely constitute deliberately knocking his opponent down. But all he needed was a moment to create two extra-thin energy tendrils, looping them around the 10,425-point headband and the 265-point headband around Bakugo's head. Then he just needed to trust that Mr. Boom Boom would do something stupid. You think you can capture me? shouted Bakugo, unleashing his quirk to disperse the tendrils surrounding him before retreating with a vicious yet victorious grin. Unfortunately, what awaited him when he looked over to see the despair on Izuka's face was a playful smile. Thanks for the extra 265 points, said Izuku, raising his hand to reveal the headbands he had snatched. With Achiko using her power to keep their team in the air, Izuka momentarily felt like a god, looking down at a very angry insect. Deku First place in the second round goes to Izuku Midoriya and his beautiful team members, Toru Hagakure, Achiko Yurarka, and Tsuyu Ajui. Let's all give them a round of applause, exclaimed Midnight, waving her whip in the air with enthusiasm. While the crowd cheered loudly in response to Midnight's words, only a few of the second round's participants joined in. The rest had somewhat gloomy looks on their faces as, after awakening Black Whip, Izuku went on an absolute tear, securing nearly every other headband. As a result, only three other teams had points, chiefly those helmed by Todoroki, Bakugo, and Mina. Izuku had spared the team that Mei was a part of, but Bakugo blitzed them at the last moment, securing their headband as a last-ditch effort to ensure his participation in the finals. Following the announcement of first place, Midnight went on to declare Todoroki's team as second, Mina's team as third, and Bakugo's as fourth. Then, to prepare for the finals, an hour-long intermission was announced, during which the qualifying students were advised to recuperate, while those who had been eliminated were given another opportunity to prove themselves in a special halftime event. As the audience and the bulk of the students began to depart, Toru, still topless, exhaled a sigh of relief before perking up and exclaiming, that was so tense. Then, while striking a pose and pointing her invisible finger at Izuku, she added, and you, warn a girl before you suddenly whip out a bunch of tentacles. They didn't feel slimy or gross, but I felt like my heart was going to burst out of my chest, agreeing wholeheartedly with Toru's remark. Tsuyu nodded her head, appending, I'm not really one to talk, but you could have told us before you suddenly wrapped us up. Some of your tentacles, never mind. Just forget about it, Ribbit. Though it was purely semantics, Izuka felt compelled to point out they were tendrils, not tentacles, with a wry smile. At the same time, he cast his gaze to Achiko, who, since the end of the event, hadn't said so much as a word. Seeing Izuka look at her, Achiko's face became progressively ruddy, until she abruptly exclaimed, W, we should probably join our classmates and get something to eat. Also, since the final event is a tournament, we'll be rivals from this point onward. I wish you the best of luck, before turning around and taking off at a speed that could rival Ida without his engines. 
While Izuku, Tsuyu, and Toru observed Achiko's departure in silence, the former couldn't help thinking, what's with the girls in this world running away after they say something? As Izuku was preparing to grab a bite to eat with Tsuyu and a now fully clothed Toru, their path was, unsurprisingly, blocked by a certain icy hot, with an admittedly good reason for his daddy issues. Can I borrow some of your time? asked Todoroki. Sure, replied Izuku, but only a little. It isn't very gentlemanly for a boy to keep girls waiting, after all. Shifting his gaze to Tsuyu and Toru, Izuku added, You girls go on ahead. I'll catch up shortly. While Toru was quick to respond with a spirited okay, Tsuyu took a moment to look between Izuku and Todoroki before stating, Wanting to compete against one another is fine, but classmates shouldn't fight. It's fine, assured Izuku. Todoroki Kuen and I aren't on legitimately bad terms. If we are to fight, it will occur in the arena. Isn't that right? Nodding his head in affirmation, Todoroki added, There's no meaning in defeating you where people can't see. Though he knew Todoroki wasn't trying to threaten him, Izuku raised his brows and remarked, Wow, that's ominous. Before shifting his gaze to Tsuyu and reiterating, Go on ahead, I'll be fine. Karo, casting one last look at Todoroki, Tsuyu exhibited extreme reluctance as she and Toru departed. She knew Izuku was capable and becoming even stronger as time passed. But if he and Todoroki were to fight one another, Tsuyu didn't think he would win. If that were to happen, Tsuyu feared that Izuka's spirit would be broken. Others may not notice it, but she could tell he wasn't nearly as confident as he pretended to be. The moment he felt even a little pressured, the smile that rarely left his face would disappear, replaced by a serious, almost grim resolution. In the wake of Tsuyu's and Toru's departure, Izuku and Todoroki moved to a more private location. There, Todoroki stared intently at Izuku, his eyes narrowing as he stated, You keep getting stronger every time I see you. Crossing his arms and narrowing his own eyes, Izuku replied, Of course, I may fool around, but I also work hard to improve. You should give both a try, just like that left side of yours. Touching the scarred left side of his face, Todoroki's expression became especially severe as he said, I can't know, it would be more accurate to say I refuse to use this side. I won't give that man the satisfaction of seeing me use his power. Feigning confusion, Izuku tilted his head to the side and asked, What do you mean? Someone gave you your quirk? And here I was, believing you had won the genetic lottery. Misconstruing Izuku's confusion as genuine, Todoroki attempted to clarify things, asking, you're aware that my father is Endeavor, right? This is the quirk I inherited from his side of the gene pool. Oh, so it was something you were born with? Asked Izuku, adding, Actually, that makes me even more confused. You claim you're denying your father the satisfaction of seeing you use his power, but all I see is you restraining yourself out of... What? Spite. Shaking his head, Izuku's expression became serious as he said, let me tell you something, Todoroki Koen, a wise man once said that hatred is like a poison you consume expecting someone else to die. I'm sure you have a good reason to hate your father, but the only way you win in this situation is by becoming happy. Holding back a power you were born with to teach him a lesson? He probably just sees it as you throwing a tantrum or going through a rebellious phase. Unable to refute Izuka's words, Todoroki fell silent and remained that way for quite some time. It was only once Izuku turned to leave, remarking, I have places to be, that he called out. Hold on, Midoriya-kun. I didn't ask you here to talk about my past or personal circumstances. I wanted to tell you that I acknowledge your power and that among the other students in our dash, finishing Todoroki's speech, Izuku joked, I need your acknowledgement about as much as I need a third code in winter. It's not useless, but I can live without it. Without waiting for Todoroki to respond, Izuka turned around and began walking away, raising his right hand as he added, I would wish you luck in the finals, but people who expect to succeed 
while living half-assly aren't worthy of such consideration. Not when so many others are trying their best just to survive. Punctuating his statement, Izuku surprised Todoroki by raising his middle finger. After all, while he sympathized with Todoroki's situation, the types of people he hated the most were those who wielded their tragedy as an excuse to act entitled. Todoroki had clearly experienced some crap, but if he seriously believed he could become the number one hero while holding back more than half his power, he was a self-righteous fool spitting in the face of everyone else's efforts. Finding a familiar figure waiting for him in the corridor, connecting to the contestant dining area, Izuku adopted a smile and remarked, I'm pretty popular today. Exhaling a light-hearted chuckle, Tashinori, presently in his All Might form, replied, You've certainly made quite the impression. Keep it up, and every hero agency in the country will be vying to have you in turn with them. I'm really proud of you, Midoriya Cohen. Not expecting such a heartfelt response, the gears in Azuka's mind briefly stalled. He recovered fairly quickly, but the smile on his face became a lot more sincere as he asked. I'm guessing you're here to ask me about what happened during the previous round. Shaking his head, Tashinori corrected. That can wait till later. After all, if it were something to be concerned about, you would have come to me or the principal post-haste. No, what I'm really here for is to congratulate you on your performance in the previous rounds. You've performed far beyond my expectations, and I know you'll do just as well in the finals. Feeling a potent sourness building in his nose, Izuku furrowed his brows and clenched his teeth. He didn't know if it was due to the original Izuka's memories or something else, but it felt painful to be on the receiving end of such considerate words. Not when he hadn't done anything to deserve them. Seeing Izuku getting choked up, Tashinori's expression visibly softened. He knew about the situation concerning Izuka's father, so he interpreted the latter's response as him being unaccustomed to praise from someone he viewed as a paternal figure. After all, with Izuku being quirkless for the first 13 years of his life, he likely didn't receive much praise from his frequently absent father. Closing the distance between them, Tashinori surprised Izuku by placing a hand on his shoulder. Then, without a word, he suddenly pulled him into a hug, whispering, You're doing great, kid, in a gentle tone. This son of a biatch, thought Izuku. Yet, in spite of his internal cursing, he didn't attempt to break free from Tashinori's grasp. Instead, he closed his eyes and internally groaned. Now I feel like even more of a piece of crap. After refusing Tashinori's invitation to chat and eat lunch together, Izuku finally arrived at the contestant's dining facility, his eyes briefly scanning the room before he closed them and exhaled a faint sigh. Most of the girls from class 1A were seated together, so if he attempted to make good on his promise to eat with Tsuyu and Toru, he would be invading their space. Unfortunately, he didn't have much of a choice when Toru bounced to her feet, waving her invisible hand as she shouted, Over here, Izuku Kuen! Ignoring the many gazes that shifted to him, Izuku made his way over to the girl's table, smiling as he noted, It looks to me like you already have a full table. I'll just go sit with the guys. What kind of nonsense are you speaking? Asked Mina. We saved you a spot between Achiko-san and Tsuchan. Don't tell me you're shy after showing off like that in the first and second rounds. As there was, in fact, a space available between Achiko and Tsuyu. Albeit with very little clearance, Izuku just shook his head in mock exasperation before taking a seat. Doing so resulted in him being sandwiched between the two girls, their thighs touching his. But he pretended not to mind it as he asked, happy with a deadpan expression and tone. Undaunted by Izuku's standoffishness, Mina smiled to her limits as she pointed out, I know at least two people who are very happy. Just look, you have Achiko-san blushing up to her ears. Mina-san, glaring at Mina, with an expression about as intimidating as a chubby-cheeked quaka, Achiko suddenly wished she had Toru's quirk instead of her own. At the same time, the thought that she may have put on a bit of weight crossed her mind. After all, 
The space between her and Tsuyu wasn't that small. Refusing to give Mina the reaction she was looking for, Izuku appeared calm and unflustered as he remarked, I can leave if you're going to use my presence as an excuse to tease others. Raising her hands and shrugging in an expression of mock helplessness, Mina replied, Then I don't really have a choice, do I? After all, if I were to cause you to leave, I think everyone here except Jiro would be upset with me. Furrowing her brows, Jiro said, Don't go dragging me into this, in her characteristically neutral tone. Seemingly having failed to hear Jiro, Mina leaned forward, staring intently at Izuku as she added, Speaking of which, I'm curious to know why you haven't tried flirting with Jiro like you have the rest of us. I definitely saw you sneaking a peek at her on the first day of school. Inserting herself into the conversation, Yairoza stated, I don't believe now is the appropriate time to ask such a question, Ashido-san. It places an undue burden on Midoriya Kuen, and I don't think Jiro-san appreciates it in the slightest. Contrasting Yairoza's assertion, Jiro surprised everyone but Mina by stating, No, I'm actually curious to hear the reason. It's been bothering me quite a bit. So now is as good a time as any to clear things up. Smiling awkwardly, Yairoza replied, I see. That's a very pragmatic way of looking at this situation. You're very mature, Jiro-san. Ignoring Yairoza's praise, Jiro directed her somewhat lazy-looking eyes at Izuko, absent-mindedly fiddling with the cord-like lobe of her right ear as she asked, Well, let's hear it. It's because you think I'm ugly, isn't it? Not everyone can have a figure like a supermodel, you know. With everyone looking to him for his answer, Izuku adopted a half-lidded expression of his own as he pointed at his face and questioned, Is that supposed to be a joke? I mean, look at me. No matter how much I train or exercise, what awaits me when I look in the mirror is a rounded face with oversized eyes and freckles. I even had to prepare an extra hero costume because my last one made me look like a wannabe military geek. Shaking his head before any of the girls could attempt to console him, Izuka's expression hardened as he revealed, The only reason I haven't tried flirting with you is because I didn't want to bother you. You present yourself as very aloof, so I thought you would be annoyed if I approached you out of nowhere. In truth, I've wanted to ask you what kinds of music you're into since the start of the term. I just never found a good time. It's that simple. Oh, slumping in her seat, Jiro suddenly felt the same way Achiko had a few minutes prior. It didn't help that Mina pointed out, See? I told you there was nothing to worry about, Jairasan. You might not have a bodacious body, but you're definitely cute. The way you press the tips of her earphone jacks against each other when you're embarrassed is especially adorable. Hearing Mina's remark, Jiro looked down to find that she was currently doing precisely what the bubbly pinkette accused her of. She had never really noticed it in the past, so now that someone had pointed it out, her face became nearly as ruddy as the shirt she wore in her hero costume. Without giving Jiro any time to recover, Mina asked yet another question that placed Izuku in the line of fire. Specifically, so, Izuku Kuin, have you put any thought into which of us you'd like to date? I was honestly a little surprised when you didn't ask any of us to accompany you during Golden Week. At the very least, no one here tattled if you did. Though he furrowed his brows slightly, Izuku, knowing pretty much all the girls wanted to hear his answer, replied, I would be lying if I said I hadn't given it a fair amount of thought. However, I've since come to realize it might be too early to pursue a serious relationship. I mean, we're still in our first year of high school and working hard to become heroes. Adding romance on top of that might be a little overwhelming. Blinking in surprise, Mina remarked, Wow, you weren't kidding when you said you prefer honesty. So long as it doesn't touch your bottom line, I bet you'll answer just about anything, huh? Shaking his head, Izuko answered, Everyone has their secrets, but if it's just asking for my opinion, I'll usually speak my thoughts. Oh, so if I were to ask who you thought was the cutest girl in class, how would you respond? Asked Mina. Without hesitation, Izuka responded, Torusan, without a doubt. 
though that's primarily based on appeal. In terms of physical appearance, I think we can all agree Yairo Zusin is the most conventionally attractive. Surprised by Azuka's words, Yairo Zu pointed to herself, asking, You think I'm attractive? As if she was completely unaware her appearance could humble idols and supermodels in equal measure. Sparing Azuka the need to respond, nearly every girl at the table nodded their heads, Mina representing them as she said, You're really beautiful, Yairo san I'm honestly a little jealous. Seeing every girl nod their head a second time, Yairoza tensed in her seat, a gratified but embarrassed smile on her face as she sat straight as an arrow. She had received similar compliments countless times, but most originated from her family. Hearing it from her classmates made her feel a distinct, vaguely familiar feeling of fluffiness. Shifting the focus back to Izuka, Mina asked, Then what about the rest of us? Now that you've mentioned metrics like physical appearance and appeal, I'm curious to know where I rank on your list. Shaking his head, Izuka pointed out, Answering that question will make me look bad, hurt someone's feelings or both. Even if I pointed out that everyone here would probably rank within the top 10 among hundreds of other girls, it wouldn't stop you from comparing yourselves. Hmm, you have a point, acquiesced Mina. However, as she couldn't help being curious, she turned her attention to the other girls at the table asking, What do you girls think? I probably don't speak for everyone, but I'm sure most of you are curious, right? As she had already been declared the most attractive, according to Azuka's standards, Yairoza didn't hesitate to reply, I'll admit, I am a little curious, but I also empathize with what Midoriya Cohen was saying before. If hearing his response would cause unnecessary tension within the class, it might be best to drop the matter entirely. So that's one person in favor of hearing Izuka Kuen's response, and one who could go either way, said Mina. How about the rest of you girls? If you're for the idea, please raise your hand. Seizing the initiative, Mina raised her right hand, prompting Toru Jiro, and somewhat surprisingly, Tsuyu to do the same. Then, undoubtedly as a result of peer pressure, Achiko reluctantly raised her hand, whispering, Sorry, Izuka Kuen, with an apologetic smile. Shaking his head, Izuku assured, It's fine. If everyone is this interested in hearing my opinion, I may as well give it. Directing his gaze to Mina, Izuku added, Since you're the cause of all of this, I'll answer your question from before. You rank third in appeal, third in physical appearance, and sixth in general affinity. With a combined total of seven points, that places you sixth in my personal ranking. Though she was initially happy, since she had placed third in both appeal and appearance, Mina's expression froze when she heard Izuku place her at the bottom of his list. She considered them fairly close, so it was quite a surprise to learn she scored so poorly in affinity. Exhaling a faintly exasperated sigh through his nose, Izuku pointed out, I did warn you. The problem with this kind of ranking is that the sample size skews things in a negative light. You're a beautiful girl, Mina, and I usually enjoy our time together. The only reason you placed sixth in affinity is due to situations like this. Not many people enjoy being put on the spot all the time. Losing her usual pep, Mina offered an awkward smile, rubbing the back of her head as she replied, I see, in resignation. She was tempted to point out she was just trying to help make things clear for everyone's sake, but it wasn't the kind of thing she could say aloud, at least not at the moment. Suppressing a second sigh, Izuka passed his gaze over the other girls at the table, asserting, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but each and every one of you are incredible in your own right. Even if you rank sixth in one of my categories, it doesn't mean you're unattractive, lacking in charm, or we have no affinity together. She might be having second thoughts right now, but I regard Mina as the girl I'm closest friends with. I just don't think the two of us would make the best couple. Not when there's someone else in our class who is so clearly infatuated with her. Eh. Regaining her senses, Mina looked at Izuku as if a banana was growing from his head, asking, Did you seriously pick up on that? 
I don't even think the person himself has realized it. Shrugging his shoulders, Izuka replied, I'm pretty observant. I mean, that should be fairly obvious, considering the topic of our discussion. I have a habit of observing and trying to quantify the people around me, not just cute girls. Shifting his attention to the other girls present, Izuko added, Speaking of which, should I continue, or should we just pretend this never happened? Honestly, I'm starting to regret my decision to go along with this. Since Izuka's gaze happened to settle on her, Jiro swallowed hard before replying, We've already come this far, so I'd like to know where I place. Nodding his head, Izuku revealed, For you, it's sixth in terms of appeal, fifth in terms of appearance, and first in terms of affinity. With a combined total of nine points, that places you in third place with two others. Though she winced when Izuka said she was ranked sixth in appeal and fifth in appearance, Jiro perked up when he mentioned he considered her the girl he had the highest affinity. Her overall position was also higher than Mina's, so she couldn't help smiling as she asked, Does that mean you think I'd make a good girlfriend? Returning a smile of his own, Izuku admitted, Yeah, you seem like the most down to -earth girl in our class. I'm also a bit of a music junkie, so I figured the two of you S could hang out and vibe together, either as friends or something more. Blinking in surprise, Jiro asked, Seriously? If that was the case, you should have said something sooner. Avoiding me for an entire month. Unable to finish her sentence, Jiro shook her head, stating, Forget it. We can talk about music and who our favorite musicians are later. For now, we should get this whole ranking thing out of the way. There isn't much time left until the finals. Nodding in approval, Izuka shifted his gaze to the person seated next to Jiro, stating, For you, Yaruzasen, you already know you rank first in terms of appearance. As for appeal and affinity, you are ranked fourth and fifth, respectively. Overall, that places you second, ignoring that she had placed second. Yairozu appeared slightly hurt as she asked, Do you not believe we would make a good couple? Shaking his head, Izuku asserted, That isn't the case. In fact, the two of us complement each other exceptionally well. I just think that if we were to date, it would be a very structured, borderline rigid relationship. There's nothing wrong with that, especially if you're looking long term, but it limits our options and forces us to restrain ourselves out of obligation. As there was a considerable amount of truth to Izuka's words, Yairoza gave a curt nod before cupping her chin as she remarked, I see. So when you refer to affinity, it's essentially a metric for short-term prospects. You aren't ready for a committed relationship. So you're looking for someone you can... What was the phrase? Vibe with? Though it was a lot more complicated than that. Izuku replied, That's a fairly accurate way to assess things. After all, it wasn't like he could say he was looking for someone he could bang. Satisfied with Izuka's response, a smile blossomed across Yairoza's face as she said, Thank you for your honesty, Izuka Cohen. All of this has been very insightful. Don't mention it, replied Izuka. In fact, once this is all over, I would be happy if the subject never came up again. For now, however, I'll continue until the end. Focusing his gaze on the invisible face of Toru, Izuka hesitated for a moment before revealing, You rank first in terms of appeal, second in appearance, and second in affinity. That gives you a combined total of 16 points, placing you at the very top of my list. Though she had hoped she would be ranked number one, Toru's mind blanked when Izuka revealed it. If anyone could see her, they would be able to see a potent blush rising from her neck spreading through her face, and finally tinging her ears a bright red. She was also unresponsive for several seconds, prompting Yairozu to give her a light shake as she asked, Are you okay, Hagakure-san? In a concerned tone. I, I'm fine, replied Toru, her voice somewhat robotic. Then, noticing that everyone at the table was staring at her, she shrunk in her seat and added, I was just a little surprised, that's all while pressing the tips of her fingers together. Hey, wait a minute, said Mina rather abruptly. 
How is Torusan ranked second when you can't even see her? I call foul. Shrugging his shoulders, Izuku elected to play things casually, stating, Call it intuition, but I've been saying Torusan is one of the cutest girls in the class from day one. If she weren't invisible, I'd wager my left arm she could give Yairoza-san a run for her money. Clicking her tongue, Mina crossed her arms in mock frustration, muttering, This isn't fair. These rankings are clearly biased. Raising his right brow, Izuka replied, Well, yeah, they're based on the preferences of a single individual. You can't get more biased than that. Reinforcing the fact she was messing around, Mina stuck out her tongue and blew raspberries at Izuko. Then, looking between Achiko and Tsuyu, she said, Well, since Izuka kuen already revealed there were three girls who shared third place, that means the two of you tied with Jirosan. The only question is, where did Izuka kuen place you in each of the rankings? It might be better for your friendship if you didn't find out. Answering without hesitation, Tsuyu asserted, No. Everyone else got to learn where they placed in each category. I want to know as well, Ribbit. With Tsuyu promptly shifting her gaze to him, staring up at him with her large eyes, Izuku adopted a wry smile and revealed, You ranked second in terms of appeal, sixth in appearance, and fourth in affinity. And once again, being ranked sixth doesn't mean you're ugly. In fact, I personally find you adorable. That's why you ranked second in terms of appeal. Nodding her head, Tsuyu said, It's okay, Izuka-chan. You don't have to convince me. I know I'm not the most conventionally attractive girl in the class, so I can settle with being the most adorable ribbit. Adopting an affection-tinged smile, Izuka nearly asked if he could pat Tsuyu's head when Achiko, who had been keeping track of every single person's ranking, said, I guess that makes me fifth in appeal, fourth in appearance, and third in affinity? Directing his smile to Achiko, Izuka replied, To be honest, you're one of the girls I think would make the best girlfriend, Achiko-san. I just worry that you'd feel indebted to me if I treated you too kindly or attempted to help out your family. Understanding exactly what Izuku was referring to, an awkward smile developed across Achiko's face as she rubbed the back of her head and said, When you put it that way, I can't easily deny it. Then, blushing quite a bit, she brought her hands to the front of her body, pressing the pads of her fingers together as she added, But if you think we'd make a good couple, I wouldn't be opposed to the idea, though he was tempted to agree to Achiko's suggestion, especially knowing she was one of the more dutiful girls present. Izuka's expression softened as he replied, I want to agree, Achiko-sen, I really do. But as I pointed out a few minutes ago, now probably isn't the best time to start a relationship. Not when we have internships, the hero licensing exam, and work studies right around the corner. Turning his attention to the other girls present, Izuko added, Besides, at this point, I'm not sure I have the right to date any of you. I thought I was being smart by casting a wide net. I've since come to realize my actions were exceedingly short-sighted. With Izuka's final words directed her way, Toru understood she was the reason he decided not to date anyone. The realization caused her to feel pained. But deep down, she was relieved he had rejected Achiko's offer. Even more so, since she knew she was Izuka's number one among all the girls in the class. Pouring cold water over the illusory steam rising from Toru's head, Mina pointed out, You mentioned before that you weren't looking for a serious relationship. The two of you could try dating as just friends and see how things develop from there. You know, kind of like when the two of us went out. A practice date. Making things much worse, Mina added. Better yet, since you've clearly put a lot of thought into this, you could try going on mock dates with each of us. Not everything can be learned from simply observing people. If you want to find out if you're truly compatible with someone, you need to go on at least one date together. Extending Toru a ray of hope, Izuka shook his head, stating, While I can't refute your words on their merits, I'm fairly confident in my assertion, it's a bad idea. One guy shouldn't date multiple girls from the same class, even if it's just practice. Blinking in surprise, Mina remarked, That's a little surprising, coming from you. With how thorough you've been, 
I genuinely believed you were trying to form a harem. Isn't that like every guy's dream? To have a girl for every day of the week. Maybe if they're children. Reply to Zuku, his expression morphing into a deadpan as he asserted. Real men are loyal to a fault. It's fine to test the waters if you're an adult, trying your luck in the dating scene. But once you enter a relationship, you have an obligation. No, a duty to see it through to the end. People who sneak around or cheat on those they purport to care for deserve every punishment hell has to give. Realizing that everyone was looking at him with expressions of shock and concern, the fury in Azuka's eyes abetted, an apologetic smile developing across his face as he said, Sorry about that. The truth is, my father has a second family in America. He basically abandoned my Ka Chan and me, so I don't have a particularly good impression of people who fool around in a relationship. Hearing about Izuka's family circumstances, each of the girls, especially Mina, had apologetic looks on their faces. If she had known about Izuka's situation in advance, she would never have made such a tasteless joke. Attempting an apology, Mina hung her head and muttered, Sorry, Izuka Kuen, I... But stopped when Izuka shook his head, saying, No, I know you were just joking, Mina-san. If anyone should apologize, it's me. I shouldn't have let my anger get the better of me like that. Recalling his encounter with the Baldi from the One for All space, Izuku couldn't help thinking his recent instabilities were the result of inheriting an emission-type quirk. He knew better than anyone he had some crap to work through, but he usually kept his emotions hidden. At the very least, he wasn't the type to lash out at unrelated people. If that were the case, he'd be no better than Todoroki. Regaining his calm, Izuku attempted to ease tensions by regaining his smile and stating, To be honest, your suggestion isn't a bad one. I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to try dating everyone here. I just can't view it as practice. If I'm going to date someone, I intend to give it my all from start to finish. That being said, turning his attention to Achiko, causing her to sit a little straighter, Izuko added, I really would like to date you, Achiko-san. You're inarguably one of the kindest and most considerate girls I know. I'm just not in the best mental or emotional state right now. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt anyone. As his words were intended to create a bit of distance between him and the girls, at least until he could get his crap sorted. Izuku was left at a loss for words when Achiko pumped her fists and exclaimed, That's no good! Izuka Kuen! When we're in pain or uncertain about the future, turning away from friends is never the answer. When friends work together, there's no hardship they can't overcome. While Izuku was momentarily at a loss for words, Mina softly but excitedly remarked, You go, Achiko-san! Now finish him off! With sparkling eyes, Though she wasn't paying attention to Mina's words, Achiko looked up at Izuko, staring at him with upturned eyes as she appealed. Please let me help you, Izuku. Whatever you're going through, I promise it'll be easier if we face it together. How the hell am I supposed to say no to this? Thought Izuku, his gaze briefly shifting to Toru. As he pointed out previously, he was the type that took relationships seriously. If he and Achiko started dating, there was a good chance they would continue dating throughout high school if not much, much longer. Seeing Izuka look her way, even if only for a brief moment, Toru's body and heart tensed. If she had known that feigning ignorance would hurt this much, she never would have broken things off between them. She had thought she was being considerate of the other girls, but now she wasn't too sure. If anything, it felt like she had sacrificed her happiness for Achiko's benefit, causing Toru's heart to twist painfully in her chest. Izuku, his gaze fixed on Achiko, said, You're right, Achiko-san. If we work together, there's nothing we can't overcome. Smiling broadly, Achiko was about to ask if that meant they could start dating, but stopped herself when Nezuka shook his head, adding, But we don't need to be dating to support one another. It's barely been a month since we began attending UA. For now, it's probably for the best that we remain friends. Maybe even best friends. Exhaling a long, 
adorably exasperated sigh. Achiko deflated in her seat as she said, I thought you might say that, with a dispirited but smiling look. She had given it her all, but it was very clear Izuku wasn't ready to start dating. It was disappointing, but knowing they could remain friends, Achiko wasn't particularly upset. At least this way, things wouldn't be too awkward between her, Tsuyu, and the girls in her class. Adopting a somewhat self-deprecating smile, Achiko perked back up as she said, Well, if you ever change your mind or just want to hang out, you have my phone number. Jairasan isn't the only one who enjoys listening to music, you know. Suppressing the notion he was a massive prick, Izuku returned a smile of his own as he replied, I'd like that, Achiko-san. Just remember, that's a two-way street. If you ever want to hang out and I'm not busy, just shoot me a text. No, even if I am busy, I can always make time for the people I care about. Hearing Izuku unabashedly insinuate she was someone he cared about, Achiko's smile became a lot broader. At the same time, she couldn't help thinking that if they exchanged texts and frequently spent time together, it wasn't much different from being a couple. Following the mid-festival intermission, the students participating in the finals were gathered in the arena to hear Midnight's explanation of the rules and to draw lots. In Izuka's case, he, unfortunately, ended up being paired against Yairozu in the inaugural match, surprising each of them quite a bit, standing across from each other on a square-shaped stage prepared by Cementos. Yairozu had a wry smile on her face as she remarked, It looks like my journey in this year's sports festival ends here. Then, with a markedly more confident look, she balled her hands into fists, striking a guts pose as she added, but make no mistake, Midoriyakin, I have no intention of giving up, punching his right hand into the palm of his left fist. Midoriya returned a smile as he replied, I expect nothing less from our class representative. Now come at me, Yairozu-sen. As the match had already started, Yairoza kicked things off in a rather interesting way, unzipping her top to reveal her toned body and a stylish black sports bra. The objects she produced with her creation quirk would destroy her clothes if she attempted to materialize them while clothed, so Yairozu had little choice but to expose quite a bit of skin if she wanted to produce something large. Accompanying a rainbow-hued flash, Yairozu materialized a medium-sized cannon from her body, shouting, Please try not to get injured! as she unleashed its explosive package in Azuka's direction. Contrasting the expectations of Yairozu and many within the crowd, Izuku didn't attempt to dodge the explosive projectile. Instead, he stood his ground, waiting until the very last moment to raise his foot, kicking the cannonball directly. This, unsurprisingly, resulted in him being enveloped by the subsequent fireball, but it barely had time to form before dozens of bluish-black tendrils dispersed it, revealing him to be unharmed. Seeing Izuku take on her most powerful attack without flinching, a look of disbelief briefly marred Yairoz's face. However, true to her word, she didn't give up. Instead, she produced several flashbangs and a canister of tear gas, shouting, Let's see how you handle this, before lobbing them in Izuka's direction. Realizing what Yairozu was up to, Izuka thought, I see she took my comment about having enhanced senses to heart. Not a bad plan, if not for the fact we're outside. Before the canisters could reach him, Izuka dashed forward at a blinding speed, bypassing them mid-flight and appearing before Yairozu in an instant. What surprised Izuku was that despite being caught off guard by his maneuver, Yairozu managed to counterattack immediately, dozens of tungsten rods erupting from her chest and abdomen to push him away and propel herself backward. At the same time, she generated canisters of pepper spray from her palms, unleashing their torrents at Izuka's face. I'm starting to see why she's ranked first in the class, thought Izuku. Yairoza's ability to adapt on the fly was extraordinary, so much so that if she were given time to strategize, Izuku felt she could defeat just about anyone, bar a few outliers, while dodging backward faster then the tungsten rods could extrude from Yairoz's body. Ten tendrils of black whip emanated from the tips of his fingers, surging forward like teal-tinged bolts of black lighting. Yairoza 
did her best to dodge. But the tendrils of Black Whip were way too fast for someone with a fairly ordinary physique to dodge. As a result, Yairozu could only grit her teeth in vexation as her wrists and ankles were bound, followed by her being flung rather unceremoniously from the arena. Izuku would have preferred a gentler approach, but the raven-haired Ojisama was simply too capable for him to hold back, without it looking like he was toying or overtly flirting with her. In the wake of his match with Yairozu, Izuku apologized for not being able to hold back against her before the two accompanied one another to the Class 1A viewing area. The next match was between Achiko and a boy whose quirk allowed him to transform into a golem-like creature. But while his power was nothing to scoff at, his speed was horrendous. By merely dodging her opponent's initial attack and touching him with the pads on her fingers, Achiko was able to secure a technical victory when the boy floated in the air, unable to do anything but flail helplessly. If not for Midnight calling the match in Achiko's favor, he might have continued floating off into space. Following Achiko's one-sided victory, Tsuyu, having drawn the shortest possible stick, appeared in the arena alongside Todoroki. He was already a bad matchup for Tsuyu due to her intolerance to cold, but things were even worse for her since Endeavor had appeared before Todoroki to give him a pep talk before the match. As a result, when Midnight signaled to begin the match, the visibly pissed off Todoroki unleashed a wave of cold that froze the entire arena. Though it wasn't as impressive as his feat of creating a stadium dwarfing iceberg in the anime, Todoroki's attack was too overwhelming for Tsuyu to endure. She attempted dodging in the air to escape the initial avalanche-like rush of frigid energy, but doing so left her completely defenseless as Todoroki unleashed a second wave while she was still airborne. She could have tried using her tongue to latch on to one of the many icy stalagmites that had abruptly formed within the arena, but she was afraid it might get stuck, like a kid licking a pole in winter. With Todoroki freezing the entire arena, the fourth match was delayed until Endeavor, alongside a few other pros, could clear away the ice. After that, Kaminari and Siro made their way onto the battlefield. However, as the latter had no way to counteract Kaminari's electrification quirk, it was another one-sided battle. Fortunately, just as the crowd was starting to get a little agitated, Ida and Tokoimi entered the arena. The former should have had the advantage in terms of speed, but thanks to a casual remark Izuka made to Tokoyami when they were discussing training methods, the latter had already begun experimenting with wearing his dark shadow and using it to fly. Doing so required him to sacrifice a bit of range, but it allowed him to keep up with Ida's speed and escape to the sky when things got dicey. Though Izuku expected Tokoyami to have an absolute advantage in the match, the primary reason for Ida's defeat was his engine stalling. His strength, agility, and dexterity were amplified quite a bit while his quirk was in use, so his perception and reaction time were simply better than Tokoyami's. If not for the versatility of the latter's quirk, it may not have been a match at all. That's how absolutely broken speedsters, even those who could only run a few hundred kilometers per hour, were. In the wake of Ida's and Tokoyami's match, Bakugo and, somewhat curiously, Kirishima entered the arena. The two had been good friends in the anime and manga, but because of Izuku, they hardly knew each other beyond initial greetings. Bakugo didn't even remember Kirishima's name, referring to him as a dumb-haired bastard, when the former expressed his interest in having a manly showdown. When the match between Bakugo and Kirishima began, Mr. Sparky Sparky Boom Man wasted no time in closing the distance, propelling himself with explosions from his palms. Kirishima crossed his arms and hardened his body to be as tough as granite, but found himself utterly overwhelmed by Bakugo's explosion-enhanced martial arts. Curiously, at least from Mizuka's point of view, Bakugo never aimed his explosions at Kirishima directly. Instead, he used primarily used them to enhance the strength of his attacks while performing acrobatic, difficult to adapt to maneuvers. Kirishima could have inflicted some real damage if he could land a blow, but Bakugo didn't afford him a single opportunity from start to finish. He's grown a lot this past month, 
thought Izuku. And because of the recent fluctuations in his emotions, he actually empathized with Bakugo since emission type quirks seem to make their wielders unstable and needlessly expressive. Name. Katsuki Bakugo. Kirk. Explosion. Current level. 25. Effective level. 50. Attributes. Strength. 53. Agility. 48. Vitality. 153. Intelligence. 81. Dexterity. 88. Luck. 78. Though his base level was higher than Bakugo's, Izuka couldn't deny the explosive youth was monstrously talented. His and Todoroki's base levels were both 25, but the latter had a luck attribute of 161, while Bakugo had a comparably modest 78. Both were level 22 at the start of the term, so it was a real testament to Bakugo's perseverance, or perhaps stubbornness, that he could keep up with someone far more talented. I just wonder who he's going to replace. Thought Izuku. Three figures immediately appearing in his mind. Most would believe the obvious choice to be Mineta, but if he had a choice, Izuku would expel Koda, the boy who could converse with animals, or Aoima, the French parody that could fire a suspiciously liquidy laser from his navel. The former, at least in Izuku's opinion, lacked the temperament of a hero. As for the latter, well, he was just way too suspicious. Name. Yuga Aoima. Kirk Navel Laser Vestige. Current level. 15. Effective level. 17. Attributes. Strength. 13. Agility. 18. Vitality. 84. Intelligence. 30. Dexterity. 16. Luck. 12. Not only did Aoima have some of the worst attributes in the class, but his quirk, naval laser, had the vestige suffix attached. In other words, it wasn't his original quirk, but one he had received from someone. Izuku had already informed the principal and Tashinori about this, but they had yet to take action since they were still investigating the matter. Aoyama's parents came from exceptionally wealthy backgrounds and were staunch contributors to the Heroes Association, so Nizu couldn't expel him without cause. Simply put, Aoyama's inclusion in the hero course was largely the result of nepotism and Niza's desire to keep Izuka's quirk a secret. The latter was fully aware of this and trusted Niza's judgment, so unless Aoyama exposed himself, there was little he could do but keep tabs on the ever-sparkling Frenchling. With the seventh round ending with Mina's victory over a random kid from the general course, Izuku was sitting in the waiting room patiently awaiting his match against Achiko, while observing Toru fight a boy with the ability to manipulate water. Unfortunately, while water manipulation was typically a powerful ability, the blue-haired teen could not produce it on his own. As only students of the support course were authorized to use support items, including a simple water bottle, the blue-haired youth's only option was to fight Toru in hand-to-hand -hand combat. However, with the latter taking off her clothes as soon as the match began. Even that wasn't an option as he couldn't see her. It was kind of hard to watch as Toru just kept shoving the boy at random to avoid being grabbed while she was naked. Talk. 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 Interrupting Izuka's focus on the monitor depicting Toru's match, a knock sounded from the entrance of the waiting room. It's open, called out Izuko, rising to his feet just in case his visitor wasn't an ally. While that was ultimately the case, he did not attempt to attack the person who had entered his room. A towering figure with a muscular build, metal pauldrons, metal arm guards, and a blue bodysuit wreathed in flames. Similar flames covered his eyes and protruded from his face like a beard and mustache, so it wasn't difficult to guess the man's identity. The number two hero in Dever. Name. Enji Todoroki. Quirk. Hellflame. Current level. 103. Effective level. 549. Attributes. Strength. 299. Agility. 165. Vitality. 4753. Intelligence. 85. Dexterity. 240. Luck. 152. 
Though Enji clearly had his quirk active, Izuku was still surprised by the man's stats. It wasn't for no reason he had been the number two hero for literal decades. He also had the highest tally of reported case resolutions, so it wasn't an exaggeration to say the man had been grinding that entire time. Interpreting Izuku's reaction as the same response most would give when meeting him for the first time, Endeavor adopted a notably practiced smile as he said, I observed your victory in the previous match and witnessed your performance during the first and second events of the festival. You have a promising future as a hero, young man. Before Izuku could pretend to be thankful for Endeavor's praise, the man revealed his true nature, adding, Unfortunately, it is my Shoto's destiny to surpass all might and become the number one hero. To that end, I expect you to do your best as a stepping stone for his future. If you can pressure him into using his flames, I will have a reward for you should you in turn at my agency. Furrowing his brows, Izuku caught Endeavor off guard by stating, You're even more of a douche canoe than I expected. I mean, what even is the point of raising your son to surpass All Might when the latter is basically on the cusp of retirement? You should have focused on, no, forget it. I'm not going to waste my time trying to reason with you. The simple truth is that Todoroki Kuin will never surpass All Might when he has someone like you holding him back. Your fantasy of living vicariously through your son's success will forever remain the delusion of a man who failed to overcome his own ego, obsessed with a rank that means nothing in the face of true heroism. You muttered Endeavor, regaining the perennial scowl he was best known for. You've got a smart mouth on you, boy. Did your father never teach you to respect your betters? Suppressing the rage welling within him behind a smile, Izuku retorted, Did yours never explain the concepts of dignity and setting an example for others to follow? Or do you think it normal for a pro hero to enter the waiting room of someone aspiring to become one, calling someone 30 years his junior a stepping stone before promising a reward in exchange for getting his son to use a power he should have felt comfortable using his entire life? If you had been a better father, Todoroki Kuin might very well be on the path to becoming number one. Now, he'll be lucky to take second in even a single sports festival before our graduation. Though his expression didn't change in the slightest, Endeavor's flames became much hotter, causing the interior of the waiting room to become like a sauna. He had anticipated Izuku taking offense to being referred to as a stepping stone. In fact, that's the entire reason he came over. To get the boy motivated, so that he might draw out Shoto's true potential. Had he known he was going to be lectured by some random brat, he wouldn't have wasted his time. Instead of lashing out or attempting to threaten Izuko, Endeavor turned away, his grasp on the waiting room's door handle, causing it to become red-hot as he asserted. As sure as the sun rises in the east, my Shoto will be the number one hero. You may come out ahead in this tournament, but all of your efforts will amount to nothing when he realizes his full potential and accepts his destiny. Waiting until Endeavor was stepping out of the room, Izuku pointedly remarked, You should start wearing a helmet from now on. I don't want you to lose what little mental capacity you have left once you fall off that ridiculously high horse of yours. Stopping midway through the door, Endeavor took one last look at Izuku over his shoulder, committing the boy's smug face to memory as he said, We'll see who falls, before slamming the half-melted door on his way out, encountering Achiko on the way to their match. Izuku could only smile wryly when she asked, Why are you sweating so much? Don't tell me you were training until just now. Shaking his head, Izuku replied, We can talk about it later, before asking, Are you ready for our match? Striking a guts pose, Achiko exclaimed, You bet. I might not be able to win, but I'll give it my all. Just be careful. I don't get my hands on you, or else. Adopting a teasing smile, Izuku raised his right hand, producing several black tendrils as he remarked, It's you who should be careful. If you try and send me floating into space, I'm taking you with me. Furrowing her brows, 
Albeit only slightly, Achiko complained, That's not fair. Izuka Quinn. If I can't even use my quirk, how am I supposed to win? Closing his fist with a pop, Izuka answered, I honestly don't know. But if you manage an upset, I'll listen to one of your requests in the future. That includes going out on a date. Blinking in surprise, Achiko asked, Seriously? Before pumping her fists a second time and exclaiming, Now I'm really fired up! With illusory flames burning in her eyes. Her reaction made Izuka feel a little awkward. But he just smiled and allowed the petite gravity girl to dream. Coming down from her momentary high, Achiko looked up at Izuku and asserted, Hold on. If my reward is being able to request something from you, it's only fair that I offer a similar prize. Or is there something else you want as a reward? Seeing Achiko staring at him with her big, trust-filled eyes, a faint sigh escaped Izuka's nose as he replied, Fine, I'll play along. As for what I'll request, how about having you dress up as my favorite heroine during our end-of-the-year Christmas party? Blinking several times, Achiko subconsciously moved closer to Izuku as she asked, Who's your favorite heroine? In a genuinely curious tone. Her own was Space Hero 13, but she doubted that Izuku, or any boy for that matter, would have such tame preferences. Regaining a teasing smile, Izuku replied, I'm half tempted to lie and answer the vigilante heroine, Pop Step. But I'll be honest and go with my genuine favorite rabbit hero, Mirko. As Mirko had been one of the top female heroes since her debut, Achiko could easily picture the muscular bunny's outfit in her mind. As such, her face went bright red as she pressed the pads of her fingers together and murmured, That might be a little much. I'm nowhere near as fit and athletic as someone like Mirko. There's no way I could pull off wearing her costume. That's something we strongly disagree on, asserted Izuku. However, the last thing I want is to make you uncomfortable. If that's asking for too much, I could always have you assist me with one of my inventions. Shaking her head rather vigorously, Achiko hastily responded, No, 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 it's fine. I don't mind trying it on if you think it'll suit me. Can I change just one teeny tiny little thing though? Sure, go for it, replied Izuku. Pressing the tips of her index fingers together, Achiko looked up at Izuku with a bashful smile as she asked, Do you mind if I only show it to you? If I wore such a revealing outfit in front of our other classmates and had my photo taken, I might die of embarrassment. Uh, recalling that there were die-hard perverts like Mineta and Kaminari in their class, Izuku didn't hesitate to respond. Sure thing. In fact, if going out is too much, you could always send me a secure photo. I promise not to share it, no matter the circumstances. Leaning forward slightly and linking her hands behind her back, a potent blush began to spread through Achiko's cheeks as she suggested, I'd rather not leave behind any evidence. How about, instead of waiting until Christmas, I purchase the outfit and invite you to my apartment to view it directly. My family lives pretty far away from Yuzutafu, so I've been living in an apartment by myself since school started. Though he knew Achiko shouldn't have any ulterior motives behind her invitation, Izuku was surprised to see how assertive she was behaving. It didn't match his image of Achiko from the anime, but that didn't stop him from adopting a smile and replying, Just let me know when everything is ready, and I'll literally come running over. Snorting in a cutesy way, Achiko rose to her full height, adopting a fairly mischievous grin as she said, Don't get ahead of yourself, Izuka Kuen. If you get complacent, I might actually come out on top. If that happens, it won't be me, wearing Mirko san's costume. Understanding the implications of Achiko's words, the smile faded from Izuka's face as he asserted, You've sealed your fate. If my dignity as a man is on the line, I'll be giving it my all from the start. That, and I really want to see you in Mirko's costume. Instead of being intimated by Izuka's words, Achiko pumped her fists one final time, exclaiming, Then let's give it our all, with the same fiery expression as earlier. After all, even if she lost in the coming match, she felt she had achieved something significant by inviting Izuku to visit her apartment. 
When Izuku and Achiko finally entered the arena at midnight, with her microphone turned off, commented, You two sure took your sweet time arriving. Are you reluctant about fighting the person you like? Contrasting Midnight's expectations, Achiko replied, I'm ready, with a serious expression, while Izuku asserted, I won't hold anything back, in a firm tone. Licking her lips, Midnight teased, Well, are you two just the cutest little things, before flipping on her microphone and shouting, Sorry for the delay, folks, but it looks like our contestants are, at last, ready and raring to go. Show them some love. Though the crowd's response wasn't nearly as loud, as it could have been. The combined force of tens of thousands of people cheering and clapping was enough to shake the stadium. Izuka could feel the vibrations through the soles of his feet, but instead of feeling intimidated, he had a confident smile on his face as he met the eyes of the girl standing opposite of him in the arena. With Izuku and Achiko in their respective starting position, Midnight raised her bondage whip high, her blue eyes sparkling with excitement as she shouted, now, without further ado, let the first round of the second elimination matches begin! Expecting Izuku and Achiko to have a nice, friendly brawl, Midnight and the spectators were more than a little surprised when the former abruptly exploded. Izuku had promised Achiko that he would be going all out, so dozen black whip tendrils, resembling teal-tinged black lightning, erupted from his body, flickering around him violently before compressing to form a protective layer around his arms, legs, and chest. Then, demonstrating a surprising degree of flexibility, he raised his right foot nearly 180 degrees, emulating one of Mirko's signature techniques as he briefly multiplied his power more than a thousand times, splitting the entire arena. Though she didn't ordinarily watch the UA Sports Festival, uninterested in the performances of a bunch of brats, Rumi Yusujiyama, better known by her hero name, Rabbit Hero Mirko had received numerous emails about a promising youth that would appear among the first years. Such an email wouldn't have been able to divert her attention away from her hero duties under normal circumstances, but as the sender was someone Mirko owed quite a few favors, she decided to check it out. Recognizing Izuka's form the moment he raised his foot, a somewhat predatory smile developed across Rumi's face as she thought. Is this cheeky little brat copying me? But what's he hoping to accomplish from so far away? Answering Rumi's question, Mizuka's leg abruptly became a blur, much too fast for the camera to follow. The aftermath of his attack, however, was all too obvious, causing Rumi's carmine eyes to widen quite a bit. She prided herself on having the most powerful legs in Japan, potentially even the entire world. So she knew how strong someone would need to be to split reinforced concrete like a karate tile. Recovering her predatory grin, Rumi couldn't help exclaiming, not bad, great even. It's no wonder that busybody of a principal sent me such an email. Looks like UA found itself a good seed. Having made up her mind, Rumi leaped to her feet, shedding the white and purple trimmed kimono she often wore in her traditional Japanese home before racing off to change into her hero costume. Near the end of his email, Nizu had asked if she would help reinforce security during the sports festival, but Rumi had refused. Now, however, she was at least a little interested in seeing how things played out. Thus, after changing into her hero outfit, consisting of little more than a sleeveless, exceptionally skin-tight white leotard, purple stockings, and a pair of white gloves, Rumi bolted from her house producing a sizable crater as she leaped several hundred meters into the air at near supersonic speeds, though he had nearly slipped into the crack he had created. Izuka was spared from embarrassing himself as the tendrils of Black Whip embedded into the surrounding concrete, preventing him from falling. As for Achiko, she had leaped into the air, remaining afloat using her quirk, but her eyes were completely round as she stared down at the devastation below. Breaking the usually bubbly girl from her stupor, Izuka called out, I told you I wasn't going to hold anything back. This should also give you some ammunition to utilize with your quirk, so if you're ready to continue, so am I. Shaking her head and waving her hands, all while tucking in her legs to prevent herself from spinning too much, Achiko loudly replied, 
No, I'm good. I've seen everything I need to understand. I don't stand a chance against you. Izuka Kuen, you're way, way, way stronger than I expected. Though he returned a smile in response to Achiko's compliment, Izuku couldn't help thinking, you say that, but if I didn't reinforce my body with Black Whip, my leg would be a mess right now. I really need to work on my timing. Using Black Whip to lower himself onto the stage, Izuku clenched his teeth as a sharp pain ran up his leg. He didn't think it was broken, but he sure as crap wasn't using it to execute any flashy moves the rest of the day. Having been paying close attention to Izuku's and Achiko's dialogue, Midnight directed her gaze to the latter, asking, Are you sure you want to forfeit the match? You won't get another opportunity like this for an entire year, you know? Releasing her quirk, Achiko landed on the arena, the extra thick padding of her shoes, cushioning the impact as she replied, It's okay, Midnight Sensei. I know when I'm beaten. Besides, not having another opportunity for a year means I can use all that time to practice. Just you wait. Izuka Kuen, I'll be 10, no, 100 times stronger next year. Nodding his head in approval, Izuka's smile broadened as he said, I have no doubt that'll be the case, Sachiko-san. But fair warning, I don't intend to slack off. Especially not when I have such a compelling reason to win. Understanding that Izuku was talking about her dressing up like Mirko, the perpetual blush marks on Achiko's face became noticeably redder. At the same time, after observing the duo's interaction with an affectionate smile, Midnight raised her bondage whip, loudly announcing Izuku as the match's victor, while Cementos repaired the arena. Izuku returned to his waiting room rather than accompanying Achiko to the Class 1A viewing stands. He wanted to cool his head before his inevitable match with Todoroki, but it seemed fate had something different in mind as he sensed something off the moment he entered the seemingly empty room. After a moment of silence, disturbed only by the faint vibrations echoing through the entire stadium, Izuka called out, Is that you, Toru-san? in a hushed tone. Following a nearly inaudible sigh, the familiar voice of Toru answered, If you're able to perceive me this easily, I'm going to lose confidence in my ability to remain hidden. Though he adopted a faint smile, Izuka questioned, Shouldn't you be preparing for your match with Minasan? With Cementa sensei on the job, repairing the arena shouldn't take long. Instead of responding to Izuka's words, the faint sound of Toru's bare feet against the tiled floor tickled the former's ears as she moved closer to him. When she eventually reached his front, Close enough that Izuku could vaguely feel the warmth radiating from her body, she surprised him quite a bit by saying, I like you, Izuka Kuen. Like, really, really like you? Opening his mouth, Izuku was going to respond when something soft, presumably Toru's fingers, touched his lips, silencing him as she added, I know I really mess things up between us, but I can't help wanting what my heart wants. Retracting her fingers from Izuka's lips, a timid but longing look adorned Toru's invisible face as she looked up at him and softly asserted, Even if we can't be boyfriend and girlfriend, I can't stand just being friends. Can we... Can we go back to how things were before our date? Understanding that Toru was referring to how they used to tease one another and exchange texts, some racier than others openly, Izuka's expression softened as he replied, We can't go back in time but we can sure as hell move toward a similar future. Though Izuku couldn't see it, he could picture a broad smile blossoming across Toru's face. In reality, she had a somewhat coy look on her face as she moved closer to him. Eyes turned up, whispering, I don't think I have the right to be your girlfriend anymore. But until you find one, I would like us to be something more than friends. Feeling Toru's melons press against him, Followed by the feeling of her tentatively touching his loins, Izuka's expression became serious as he whispered, You deserved better than that, in a slightly disproving tone. Yet, even when Toru began caressing his bulge, he made no overt attempt to stop her. Responding to Izuka's assertion, Toru shook her head, stating, You're wrong. I've been a bad girl my entire life. The only reason I decided to become a hero 
was to place my parents' worries at rest. But even more than that, what I most enjoy is sneaking around, spying on people, and doing things no girl should do in public. That's the actual reason I broke things off between us. You're such a considerate person, Izuka Kuin. You deserve a normal, devoted girlfriend like Achiko-san. Not some pervert who gets excited that a packed stadium and 300 million people at home are seeing me completely naked. Though he had long suspected everything Toru was revealing, especially with how quickly her pictures became risque, Izuku was surprised to hear her admit it so soon. He expected that if, or when they started dating, she would slowly test the waters before gradually dragging him into the deep end of exhibitionism. Disclosing her secret so early was incredibly risky on her part, but it also showed how serious she was, feeling Izuku's surprisingly large bulge hardening against her palm. Toru felt nervous yet emboldened as she stood on the tips of her toes and whispered, I'm a bad girl, Izuku Kuin, but if you help me keep it a secret, I could be your bad girl. Regaining a faint smile, Izuku gave his best smoldering look as he replied, you're wrong, Torsen. You might be a pervert, but you aren't a bad girl. From the moment I met you, you've been nothing short of amazing. Before Toru could refute him, Izuka surprised her by wrapping his arms around her waist, cupping her large and pliant jiat cheeks as he added, If you believe your actions make you a bad girl, I'm a straight-up villain. As for becoming mine, it's not too late for us to start dating. Achako and the other girls might feel betrayed, but that was always bound to happen once I started dating someone. I simply can't make everyone happy, even if I wish I could. Contrasting Izuka's assertion, Toru believed that if it was him, he might actually be able to pull it off. All the girls in class liked him to varying degrees, so if he had gone with Mina's suggestion, he could have dated all of them. They might call it practice at first, but that distinction would invariably blur as time passed. Then Izuku could have gone a similar route as the playboy hero from America, Captain Celebrity. Instead of trying to convince Izuku, he was far more charismatic than he seemed to think. Toru stood on the tips of her toes and kissed him. Unlike the past, however, the kiss was longer and far more intense, partly due to her being undraped, but primarily the result of Izuka's hands on her jiat. That, and the fact Izuka was surprisingly good at kissing, separating after nearly a full minute. Toru's breathing was heavy as she stared into Izuka's paradoxically calm yet intense eyes. He didn't appear to be even remotely flustered. Instead, his deep green eyes reflected the expectation in his voice as he asked, Is this really what you want, Toru? without honorifics, shaking her head, though Izuku could only feel, not see it. Toru's gaze became similarly intense as she said, If I told you what it was my heart truly desired, you might hate me. That could never happen, lied Izuku. At the very least, you would have to do something pure and intentionally malicious for me to even consider hating you. Is that the real, honest truth? asked Toru linking her arms around Izuka's shoulders in the process. Then, when he nodded in affirmation, she whispered something into his ear that caused his eyes to become as round as saucers. Specifically, I want to see you do it with other girls, in a tone comparable to a succubus. Blinking in surprise, Izuku asked, seriously, with a look of disbelief on his face. Toru had made it clear she was a voyeur, but he never expected her to have such extreme tastes. Nodding her head, Toru clarified, only if they're okay with it. I may be a bit naughty, but I don't want either of us to become actual criminals. Adopting a wry smile, Izuku found himself at a loss for words. He had been fairly active in his previous life, but he had never had a threesome or allowed someone to sit in as he clapped cheeks. If he was being honest, it was really weird. However, instead of voicing that thought aloud, he gave a non-committal. I doubt it'll be the case, but if I get a girlfriend and she's open to the idea, we'll discuss it at that time. Though Izuku couldn't see it, a broad smile plastered itself across Toru's face. Except for Jiro and Tsuyu, she was reasonably confident she could convince the other girls to let her watch. 
if not join in. Achiko gave the impression of a girl open to experimentation, and Mina was nearly as free-spirited as her. That only left Yairozo, but if she and Izuka managed to overcome the obstacle of her family and enter into a relationship, Toru got the impression she would be willing to try just about anything once. After all, Yairozu was a very prudent girl. Dismissing her wayward thoughts, at least for the time being, Toru drew her lips closer to Izuka's, asking, So, what now? Uh, I still feel it's too soon for us to cross the line, but there are other things we can try, and I mean a lot of other things. With nearly two and a half years of pent-up frustration, including the time he spent in country during his previous life, Izuku found it extraordinarily difficult to resist Toru's temptation. He didn't think it was healthy for them to have such an advanced relationship at their age. However, as he didn't want to hurt Toru's feelings or make her feel there was something wrong with her, he eventually answered, You've clearly put a lot of thought into this. How about surprising me? Smiling to the point her eyes narrowed in glee. Toru's voice was especially chipper as she replied, Then you better prepare yourself, Izuku, because it's going to be shocking. Though she didn't explain what she had in mind, Toru's intentions became very transparent when she released Izuku from her grasp, followed by his gym trousers being pulled down rather abruptly. Losing a bit of her enthusiasm, Toru asked, Uh, is it supposed to be this big? While experimentally poking Izuka's rather sizable tent. Shaking his head, Izuka replied, 19 centimeters is hardly what I'd call big, but I appreciate the compliment. I'm hoping to hit at least 25 centimeters before I finish my growth spurt. Maybe it's because it's right in front of my face? Asked Toru. Well, not that it matters. I'm going to give it my all, either way. Following Toru's exclamation, Izuku felt a somewhat warm wrap around his shaft, presuming it to be the invisible girl's hand since. Less than a second later, he felt something moist and hot flicking the tip of his sausage. It's not as salty as I was expecting, remarked Toru, punctuating her statement by wrapping her lips around Izuka's glands. It was a pleasant, almost nostalgic feeling, but what caused Izuka's eyes to widen was his sausage disappearing as Toru experimentally began to hawk to on it. Though he had witnessed food disappearing whenever Toru ate, Izuka felt an indescribable feeling of incongruency when seeing the tip of his sausage vanish and reappear. He also had no point of reference for what Toru was doing, as he couldn't see her face. So each of her actions came as a surprise, drastically amplifying the feeling of pleasure. Ah, uh, guys, Omni-sensei here. You can already tell where this is going, and because of YouTube, I have to stop it here. If you want a slightly edited version of the entire scene, check the version on my Rumble channel or on my Patreon. Link in the description. Now on with the story. With Todoroki defeating Tokoyami, Bakugo defeating Kaminari, and Mina beating Toru rather one-sidedly, it was time for the first round of the third brackets. Izuku vs. Todoroki. Standing across from the icy hot youth, Izuku, wearing a relaxed smile and exuding a calm, confident aura, remarked, You saw what I could do during my match against Achiko-san. Are you still thinking you can beat me with just half your power? Furrowing his brows slightly, Todoroki replied, I must, in a firm, or more accurately, stubborn tone. Izuka's previous remarks had given him a lot to think about, but now wasn't the time nor place for introspection. All he was concerned about was seizing victory with the quirk he inherited from his mother. With present Mike announcing the start of their match, Todoroki wasted no time in sending a wave of ice surging toward Izuku. Most students would have struggled to dodge such an attack, but Izuku didn't even try, rearing back his right fist before unleashing a powerful punch that destroyed the ice and sent a wave of pressure crashing into Todoroki's body. Ku, Realizing that Izuku was trying to knock him out of the ring, Todoroki manifested a wall of ice behind him, declaring... I won't lose, before sending a much stronger wave of ice, this time resembling an avalanche that enveloped most of the arena. 
Someone who half-asses things has no right to make such a claim, shouted Izuku, creating a divide within the avalanche by crossing his arms and sweeping them in a manner reminiscent of All Might's Missouri Smash. As two walls of ice formed around him, Izuku extended several tendrils of Black Whip into them, fracturing the ice and grabbing several large chunks to send Hurtling toward Todoroki. The latter countered by creating a large wall of ice, but the frost building on his face, clothes, and right arm made it clear he was reaching his limit. Leaping into the air, Izuka shouted, Tell me, Todoroki Kuen, what will you say to the families of the people you failed to save when they demand to know why you didn't utilize your full power? Why you allowed their loved ones to die when you could have saved them? Not giving Todoroki a chance to respond, Izuka controlled his strength just enough to shatter the ice wall the former had created. The moment he did so, a tremendous volume of icy energy impacted his face, but he just tore through it, grabbing the half-frozen brat by his collar and pulling him close as he shouted, Will you tell them, sorry your husband, wife, or children had to die? My daddy issues were far more important than giving it my all to save them. Overwhelmed by Izuku's words and piercing, incredibly judgmental gaze, Todoroki found himself unable to respond. Unfortunately, Izuku had no intention of waiting for him to get his crap together, narrowing his eyes as he asserted, Your existence is an insult to everyone who takes being a hero seriously before shoving him hard toward the edge of the arena. Unable to recover and arrest his momentum in time, Todoroki fell out of the arena and tumbled several meters before regaining his footing. Then, when he looked back up at the arena's edge, he found Izuku staring down at him, his expression seemingly devoid of emotion as he said, You're just like your father, short-sighted and egotistical. Abandoning his usual apathetic mask, Todoroki's expression morphed into a fierce glower as he asserted, I am nothing like that man, in a defiant tone. Furrowing his own brows, Izuku replied, Then prove me wrong. Be a real hero. Not someone obsessed with rankings just to prove a point or spite someone. That isn't heroism. It's petulance. As Midnight had already declared him the victor, Izuku turned away from Todoroki and made his way to the opposite side of the arena, descending the stairs to return to his waiting room. The one assigned to him was on the complete opposite side of the stadium, but he didn't feel like walking past Todoroki or encountering Endeavor, waiting with arms crossed and a grim look on his face. I'm an idiot, remarked Izuku, barely making it halfway to his waiting room before present Mike called for him to return over the intercom. He had known the second semifinal match was between Bakugo and Mina, so he should have stuck around to console the latter when she inevitably had her, but kicked. Instead, he had to rush back to the arena, finding an impatient Bakugo waiting for him on the stage. With crossed arms and a perpetually pissed off look on his face, Bakugo stared down at Izuko, his husky voice filled with venom as he said, Get up here, you moss-headed bastard. I don't know how you got so strong, but I'm going to kick your butt and prove to everyone here which of us really has what it takes to be a hero. Staring up at Bakugo, Izuka didn't respond, remaining completely silent as he weighed the pros and cons of fighting the explosive teen. As bizarre as it sounded, withdrawing from the match would probably have the greatest effect, leaving Bakugo at his wit's end with fury. Shaking such thoughts from his mind, Izuku thought, whatever, maybe if I beat the crap out of him, it'll somehow have a positive influence on his character. This world is based on a shonen anime, after all. Having made up his mind, Izuku leaped onto the stage, intentionally jumping over Bakugo before twisting and flipping over midair to land on his feet. His base dexterity was 100, 10 times that of his strength and agility. With his passive 10x multiplier, that meant his base dexterity was effectively 1000. As a result, his spatial awareness, muscle control, and sense of balance were off the charts. The secret that allowed him to wield Black Whip and move his body however he pleased. 
Seeing the smug look on Izuka's face, Bakugo balled his hands into fists, clicked his tongue, and muttered, Damn show off. Let's see you grin when I kick your teeth in. Under his breath, hearing Bakugo's utterance, another benefit of his extreme dexterity, Izuka's smile became even broader as he briefly considered fighting with his hands behind his back. Unfortunately, while it might be effective in pissing Bakugo off, it would also make him look arrogant in the eyes of the spectators. As much as Bakugo annoyed him, he wasn't willing to sacrifice his good reputation to teach him a lesson. Catching Bakugo off guard, Izuka channeled his inner Deku as he raised his fist and said, I know better than anyone how powerful you are, Kachan, so I'm going to give it my all. That way, regardless of the outcome, I won't have any regrets. Gritting his teeth hard enough that the muscles in his jaw became visible, Bakugo suppressed the urge to tell Izuku to go F himself as he lowered his body into his starting position, hands angled behind him like the boosters of a rocket. Izuku was the one to state they shouldn't refer to each other familiarly, so Bakugo interpreted his words as nothing but provocation and an attempt to make himself look good. Exhaling a faint sigh through his nose, Izuka got into a loose variation of a Muay Thai pose, a no-frill stance that allowed him to transition between punching and kicking freely. His vitality had decreased below the halfway point after his matches with Achiko and Todoroki, but he wasn't worried. After all, with just a 10x base multiplier, all his attributes were higher than Bakugo's. With present Mike announcing the start of the match, Bakugo shouted his usual, Deku, as he propelled himself forward, transitioning into a flying kick partway. Extending his left hand, Izuku produced multiple tendrils of Black Whip, attempting to entangle Bakugo's ankle. In response, the latter used his explosion quirk to abruptly change his trajectory, spinning to evade the lightning-like tendrils as he shouted, The same trick won't work on me twice! Punctuating his statement, Bakugo released a decently sized explosion a few meters away from Izuka's face, mostly to obscure his vision but also to push him back. Unfortunately, while he succeeded in the former, Izuku rushed into the ball of flame, leaving Bakugo somewhat confused when he flipped over it to find the former missing. Where the foo dash before Bakugo could finish asking where he had gone, Izuku revealed his location by grabbing the former's ankle with his hand, stating, You're kind of slow, in a matter-of-factly tone of voice. Without giving Bakugo a chance to respond, Izuka spun him around like a professional hammer thrower. Unfortunately, Bakugo had no intention of playing along or letting him do as he pleased, interrupting the spin with an explosion before twisting his body in a surprising display of flexibility, his foot nearly hitting Izuka's face, but ultimately impacting his palm. This makes things easier, remarked Izuko, once again proceeding to spin Bakugo like a hammer. This time, however, he began ramping up the energy of one for all, drastically increasing his speed and ramping up the centripetal forces faster than Bakugo could disrupt them. Since he might accidentally kill Bakugo if he threw the explosive youth into one of the stadium's walls, Izuko ultimately flung him high into the sky, literally flinging him hundreds of meters into the air, while the crowd watched on with stupefied looks on their faces. With plenty of time to recover, Bakugo eventually regained his balance and suspended himself in the air with his explosions. He had passed out for a moment from the G-forces, enough to cause his nose to bleed and eyes to become bloodshot. But he pretended to be unaffected, bellowing, I won't go down that easily, before descending toward the arena like a meteor. Using his explosions to spin himself like a bullet, Bakugo shouted, Let's see how you like my ultimate move. Howitzer impact! an attack that caused a veritable tornado of flames to form around him. Hmm. Taking advantage of his accelerated thought processes and enhanced perception of time, Izuka marveled as Bakugo's attributes increased in real time. It wasn't nearly as extreme as the boost provided by One for All, but it was still fairly impressive. Name. Katsuki Bakugo Quirk Explosion. Current level. 25. Effective level. 50 to 111. Attributes. Strength. 
53 to 318. Agility, 48 to 291. Vitality, 153 to 75. Intelligence, 81. Dexterity, 88 to 270. Luck, 78. An increase of 61 levels when using an ultimate move. The hit to his vitality is pretty extreme, but it's an excellent finishing move. At least, it would be against a normal opponent. As Bakugo descended toward him like a meteor, Izuku reinforced his hands and arms with Black Whip, boosting his attributes by around 500x as he clapped his hands together. The main benefit of One for All, at least in his opinion, was that it allowed its user to generate shockwaves as if they were some form of key blast. 5,000 strength and agility wouldn't be enough to produce a significant amount of wind pressure on their own, but as most of the energy was discharged, rather than being transmitted back into his hands, it created a visible wall of pressure that stopped both Bakugo and his ultimate movement air, making him look as though he had his face and body pressed up to a glass pane. Reminded of one of his favorite manga series from his previous life, Air Gear. A nostalgic smile developed across Izuka's face as he mused. Not bad. But you'll need more than that to overcome my defensive ultimate. Ode to the Rumble King over Ode. Suppressing the feeling of cringe that seemed to exude from the very core of his soul, Izuka leaped into the air, inverting his body to perform a flying kick as the pressure wave preventing Bakugo's fall faded. His base vitality had dipped below 30% after his little stunt, so he decided it was best to end the fight before he could embarrass himself further. What he didn't expect was for Bakugo to already be knocked out, the whites of the boy's eyes showing as he tumbled out of the sky like a ragdoll. Nen, Ketsuke Bakugo. Quirk, explosion, current level, 25, Effective level, 50. Attributes, strength, 53 to 8. Agility, 48 to 0. Vitality, 153 to 23. Intelligence, 81 to 65. Dexterity, 88 to 0. Luck, 78 to 80. With Bakugo unable to participate in the reward ceremony due to his injuries, Izuku and Todoroki were relatively alone as they stood atop their respective podiums, waiting for the hatch above to open up so they could be elevated into the arena. Seeing Todoroki standing with his head hanging and shoulders slumped, the awkward tension became too much for Izuku to bear, compelling him to say, Look man, I hope there are no hard feelings between us. I know what I told you before wasn't exactly polite but I was annoyed after your father paid a visit to my waiting room. I didn't have to say those things or embarrass you like that. Though Izuku didn't actually apologize, his words were enough to break Todoroki out of his brooding contemplation, an annoyed look marring his face as he looked up and asked, He came to your waiting room? What did he say? Something I imagine you're pretty familiar with, replied Izuku. He called me a stepping stone, and went on about how it's your destiny to surpass all might and become the number one hero. He also wanted me to pressure you into using your flames, even offering me a reward if I managed to do and chose his agency for my internship. Furrowing his brows even deeper, Todoroki remarked, That definitely sounds like him, without asking how Izuka responded to his father's offer. After all, it was fairly obvious he hadn't accepted it. Bringing their conversation to an abrupt end, one of the stagehands shouted for them to be careful and not lose their balance, while the hatch above them opened, revealing the blue sky overhead. We'll talk later, said Izuku. For now, even if you're not in the best state, you should raise your head and present yourself with dignity. Real heroes aren't seen moping, at least not in front of the people they have a duty to protect. Setting the example... Izuku stood straighter, a confident smile developing across his face as he raised his chin slightly and puffed out his chest. He didn't actually care about taking first place in the sports festival, but he could at least pretend to for the hundreds of students that would readily trade places with him. 
Waiting for Izuku and Todoroki's podiums to reach the apex of their short journey, Midnight struck a cheerleader-like pose with her whip, shouting, Let's all give a round of applause for our first and third place finishers, Izuku Midoriya and Shoto Todoroki from Class 1A. With the crowd erupting in cheers, the smile on Izuka's face became a lot broader. Todoroki had a comparably deadpan look, but at least he wasn't moping about like before. Now it's time to confer the medals, shouted Midnight. And the one who will present the medals this year is naturally Dash, crashing down into the arena like a human meteor. Tashinori, in his all-might form, bellowed, IT is I, All Might, and I'm here with the medals. If the crowd was cheering before, they practically erupted when All Might appeared, wearing his Golden Age costume. Various news agencies and public figures had been speculating about his retirement since he became a teacher at UA, but he was still the number one hero. The reputation and status he had built over the past 40 years echoed globally, but nowhere louder than the stadium he was currently standing in. After promising his classmates they would meet up the following day for a celebration, Izuku, once again, found himself in Principal Niza's office. This time, it was only him, the principal, and Tashinori present, the latter appearing a little choked up as he said. I know I already said this, but I'm proud of what you've accomplished today, Midoriya. Not only did you take first place, but you also did your best to inspire the other students. I have a few notes, but I couldn't have asked for a better result. Nodding in agreement, Nizu added, it really was a marvelous display of skill and control. Though I am a little worried, with you awakening a quirk associated with a past user of One For All, I fear your status as All Might's successor has been revealed. As such, there is something I would like to propose, an arrangement I believe you will be more than pleased to hear. If it's something arranged by the principal, I have little doubt that will be the case, replied Izuko, fully trusting Misa's foresight and judgment. The tiny cat bear mouse had been an influential and supportive ally to him, so much so that he had already set the incident with Detective Tsukachi in the back of his mind. Linking his paw-like fingers together, Nizu revealed, As the inheritor of one for all, it isn't an overstatement to say you're this nation's hope. As your principal, I have a duty to ensure you're able to realize your potential and complete your studies without fear of villainous retaliation. As such, I would like to invite you and your mother to live on the campus, far beyond the reach of normal villains. As the safety of his mother was one of the things he was most concerned with, Izuku didn't hesitate to respond, I couldn't ask for more. Thank you, Principal Nizu. Though it was a little awkward since he was sitting down, Izuku lowered his head as steeply as possible. He had planned to make a similar request once the dorms were constructed but this was much better. Now, even if the incident at the summer training camp doesn't occur, you won't have to worry about returning home to find it ransacked and his mother missing. I cannot even begin to express how truly grateful I am. Added Izuku, a bit of his emotions leaking out as his throat tightened. Adopting an appreciative smile, Niza replied, You are very welcome, Midoriya Kuen. Truth be told, we completed these arrangements some time ago, but I wanted to save the revelation as a reward. You've worked very hard, so you certainly deserve one. Raising his head, Izuku adopted a smile of his own. However, before he could say anything, Mizu added, and that brings us to our next topic. With Mizu directing his gaze to Tashinori, Izuku did the same, his eyes becoming progressively wider as the lanky man revealed. I've talked it over with the principal, and we've decided to transfer ownership of some of my accounts over to you. Nodding his head, Niza's smile broadened as he appended, I've been handling Tashinori Kuen's finances for quite some time. When I proposed doing the same for you, he suggested transferring most of his assets to you. Now, you won't have to worry about your finances. Instead, I'd like you to focus on developing your quirk and mastering the power of one for all. You're also free to invest time and energy into the production of support items, but I believe you've already found someone more suited to that task. If not, well, Tashinori Kuen and I have even more good news. 
With Mizu passing him the baton with his gaze, a glimmer of nostalgia reflected in Tashinori's blazing blue eyes as he revealed, I'm sure you will receive one of your own in the coming days, but I received an invitation to attend this year's Eye Island Expo from the daughter of my close friend. You probably know him as the man who served as my first ever sidekick, the brilliant inventor who went on to shake the world with his innovative spirit and passion for helping others, David Shield. Excited by the notion of meeting one of the world's most brilliant scientific minds, Izuku asked, Are you suggesting I attend iExpo as your guest? If so, I am more than happy to oblige. Striking a pose that didn't suit his skeletal form, Tashinori waggled his index finger from side to side as he clarified, While it's true I'm inviting you to attend the expo, there is another reason I'm bringing you along. Dave's daughter, Melissa, is just as brilliant as her father. She also wishes to follow in Dave's footsteps, so, as my successor, I wanted to introduce you. The two of you are similar in age, so she would make a phenomenal sidekick once you become a pro. As Melissa was nearly as famous as her father, holding the top ranking in I Island Academy since her enrollment, Izuku was intimately familiar with her. She was quirkless, but some of the patents she had filed looked like devices straight out of science fiction. Izuku had always wanted to meet her, but the prospect of teaming up with her was just insane. It would be like having a female Tony Stark in his back pocket. Too taken aback to offer a better thought out response, Izuka replied, I mean, I wouldn't be against the idea, adopting a squinty eyed smile and giving a thumbs up. Tashinori left Izuku even more speechless by adding, Lucky for you, she happens to be a very attractive young lady. With your shared interest in developing support items, you may be able to become more than sidekicks. You're young, so now is the best time for such things. If you follow my example, you'll end up an old man without anyone to welcome you home. Though he knew Tashinori was making a joke, it was impossible for Izuku to miss the loneliness in his eyes. He was certain that Tashinori had more than his fair share of women throwing themselves at him. But because of his dedication to duty and the burden thrust upon him as a successor of one for all, he was presently 56, his body ruined, and no wife or kids to share his final years. Maybe when I rescue Eri, she can use her power to restore his body to its prime. After that, well, my mother is a very lonely woman. While the thought of calling Tashinori, his father, gave him goosebumps, the weary hero had been more of a parent than his actual father. Izuku had never met the man, but the memories he inherited from Deku were all he needed to disdain him to his core. Compared to that paragon of human filth, Tashinori was a literal saint. Adopting a faint smile, Izuku surprised Tashinori by suggesting, Since my Kachan and I will be living on the campus, you're more than welcome to stop by for dinner. If you'd like, you can even live with us. After all, even if your power is diminishing, you're still all might. I wouldn't have to worry if I knew someone like you was protecting her. Believing Izuku was just being kind, a gratified smile developed across Tashinori's face as he replied, I would be honored to join you for dinner sometime. However, I'll have to decline the offer to stay with you. Thank you, though. I am grateful knowing you were prepared to share your home with me. Since he couldn't force the matter, and also because Tashinori currently looked like a skeleton, Izuku's expression softened as he replied, If you ever change your mind, the offer stands. You granted me your power, and have now vested me with tremendous wealth. I'm absolutely confident I could have succeeded on my own, but nearly everything I have right now is given to me by you, Tashinori-san. This might sound a little forward, but I sincerely regard you as my family. If not a father figure, then a very awesome uncle. Not expecting Izuka's words, Tashinori muttered, Midoriya Kuin, as tears began to well in his eyes. Unfortunately, at that exact moment, the door to the principal's office was kicked open, accompanied by a bronze-skinned, bunny-eared woman shouting, How much longer are you going to make me wait? Author's note, Mirko be like, I'm on the cover of the freaking novel, 
Now is my time to shine. Also, enjoying the story and want to help me stay motivated? Consider becoming a patron. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much and it keeps me going. Plus, it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.